I have always found comfort in the rain. It's always been a really nice setting, one meant for dressing comfortably, staying at home, and finding a good story, whatever the medium may be. For some, it might be a nice movie, for others, a good book, but for me, I'll always enjoy sitting down and playing a game with the story that I can get immersed in. While my favorite video game is, well, FIFA? A nice game with a good story can keep me entertained and focused for several hours. Some of my favorite games have been the likes of Horizon Zero Dawn, The Last of Us, and even smaller games like Firewatch and What Remains of Edith Finch. But finding these types of games isn't always easy, especially when I just don't have that much time anymore. A few months ago, by pure chance, I happened to have a long weekend. I didn't have any work or any other major responsibilities in that time, and since it's becoming increasingly more rare for me to get three days off in a row, I wanted to do some sort of gaming, and more specifically, something that I could do over the course of those three days. So not just FIFA. I ended up looking through my Steam wishlist and found Detroit Become Human. I had never played the game before and had intentionally avoided spoilers because I knew one day I would. It also happened to be on sale. So I picked it up telling myself that if I didn't enjoy it by the end of the opening sequence then I could just refund it and move on. That didn't happen. I was hooked by the end of the opening credits. In fact, I kind of ended up playing the entire thing in one straight sitting. Yeah. I started at about 2 p.m. and only stopped to have dinner, but that left me with two more days to myself, and having enjoyed the game so much, I wanted to see what the developer Quantic Dream made. One of their earlier games was one that I had played Beyond Two Souls, which I also thoroughly enjoyed. It also happened to be on sale, and it was bundled with another Quantic Dreams game, and the focus of today's video, Heavy Rain. Having come out in 2010, it had incredibly high reviews. We're talking 9 out of 10 from IGN and Eurogamer, 9.5 from Game Informer, 8.5 from GameStop, and an 87% on Metacritic. So it caught my attention. And having already played a game by these developers whose story I really enjoyed, I was really excited for this one. So I played it over the course of those two remaining days, and well, I didn't hate it. The best way that I can describe it is like, you know how the first seven seasons of Game of Thrones kind of don't mean anything because the eighth season is just so bad it ruined it all? Welcome to the video game version of that.
The original Bioshock is widely considered to be one of the best games of modern gaming. Not only was the gameplay interesting and enjoyable, it also told a really good story. See, you play as a man named Jack who finds himself in the underwater city of Rapture trying to survive. You make your way through the various parts of the city, fighting off enemies and using special abilities to do so. The whole time, a man named Atlas is helping you, but also kindly asks for you to help him in return. His main goal, though, is to stop a man named Ryan, who has apparently kidnapped his family. So after a whole bunch of escapades, you eventually meet Ryan face to face. And up until that point, it's a rather standard first-person shooter. Like, sure, you have those unique abilities, like I said, and you are facing interesting adversaries, but so far, the game has just been go to area, kill enemies, complete objective. That is, until Ryan starts speaking and tells you the truth about what's really been going on. The assassin has overcome my final defense, and now he's come to murder me. In the end, what separates a man from a slave? Money? Power? No. A man chooses. A slave obeys. You think you have memories. A farm. A family. An airplane. A crash. And then this place. Was there really a family? Did that airplane crash? Or was it hijacked? Atlas was never your ally. From the very beginning, you were but a pawn in his game of revenge. But that's not the twist. That's actually a pretty common trope only meant to serve the actual twist, because instead, the defining moment of this game came from the revelation of the true meaning behind three words. Would you kindly? A phrase heard throughout the game as Atlas asks you to do those various tasks, and where the player may have once thought he was simply being polite, it's instead revealed that the words are a code phrase meant for you to do whatever action follows. Force down. Forced down by something less than a man, something bred to sleepwalk through life until they are activated by a simple phrase spoken by their kindly master. Was a man sent to kill or a slave? A man chooses. A slave obeys. Though it's certainly a surprising moment for any first-time player, as a story element, it works extremely well. Not only does it recontextualize that which came before, like a good reveal does, but it elevates the story as a whole through that crucial piece of information you didn't even know you were missing in the first place. On subsequent playthroughs, it's entirely possible to find the hidden puzzle pieces and see the picture you couldn't the first time around. Knowing the full story does not take away from the replayability at all, because even if you know the reveal, you're not really left with any questions you shouldn't have. On the other hand, Heavy Rain is a game that spends 12 hours telling the story of four different characters, ultimately building up to a reveal that has more holes than Swiss cheese, and it is all quite insulting towards the player. When Heavy Rain was first released on the PS3 in 2010, there weren't really any other games like it out at the time. After all, you have to keep in mind, this was the same year that saw the release of Call of Duty Black Ops, Halo Reach, Red Dead Redemption, Fallout New Vegas, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Mass Effect 2, Dead Rising 2, Alan Wake, Just Cause 2, God of War 3, Amnesia The Dark Descent, Civilization 5, Mafia 2, and of course, to top it all off, FIFA 11. Okay, I'm joking about FIFA 11, but none of these games are remotely similar 
to heavy rain, which leads me to a question. What kind of genre is heavy rain? Now, if you've played the game before, you might be finding that difficult to answer. Games like Call of Duty, Halo, and Just Cause are all shooters with slightly different settings, or vastly different settings. Alan Wake is a mystery horror. But what about Heavy Rain? Well, it's sort of an action game. A little bit of a mystery. Video memo recording, Agent 47023, Nam and Jaden, Tuesday, October 4th, 2011. Time is 8.49. It's got some drama. Very well. I'm the origami killer. It's an interactive story. It's a melting pot of various ideas and genres, none of which are really strong enough to stand on their own, but when combined, almost seem to work. So what kind of game is Heavy Rain then? Well, despite the mix of all those genres, even calling it a game to begin with feels like a bit of a stretch. In 2015, Frictional Games, the same people who made Amnesia The Dark Descent, released the somewhat of a horror game, Soma. In reality, it's about 90% of a walking simulator filled with scary sounds and things that go bump in the night. Unless you are easily frightened, the horror aspect of Soma is pretty much non-existent. Most of the time, there aren't really any enemies around, and the ones you do run into are either trivially easy to avoid, or so annoying you can't wait to just get past them. There aren't really any puzzles to solve or challenges to overcome, you're pretty much just walking, sneaking, or talking to your companion Catherine. And if that sounds like a boring, miserable experience, that's because you're right. It absolutely is. Yet. Soma has overwhelmingly positive reviews, mainly due to the fantastic story that it tells. It drip feeds you just enough information as you go along to keep you invested and keep you wanting to move forward and learn more. Because if you just get over there, or you just get into the submarine, then you'll learn just a little bit more about what's going on. This of course means though, if the player doesn't particularly enjoy the story of Soma, then they're not going to enjoy the game. Because there isn't really a game. And in my opinion, Heavy Rain is extremely similar. With the big difference being that the gameplay of Heavy Rain forces the player to be more interactive. Most games, even those with a set story, let the player be in full control of the character. The player, not the game, is the one taking actions and making decisions about what to do. Even in Bioshock, you're still able to walk Jack around, go where you like, or do what you want for the most part. But in Heavy Rain, the player isn't really in control of the characters. While there are moments where you can walk around and interact with things, you're usually in a limited space with limited actions. For instance, when playing as Ethan, you can't just leave the hotel whenever you want, but you can sit on the bed and do nothing. Okay, quick side note here. This is the one thing about Quantic Dreams that they have not learned in any of their games and they really need to stop doing because they need to stop putting useless interactions into games. If I can't do anything when sitting on the bed or sitting in the chair, then there is no reason for me to be able to sit on the bed or in the chair at all. It's not immersive or interesting, it's just annoying. But anyway, the majority of the gameplay in Heavy Rain, if one can even call it that, has the player be along for the ride more than anything. 
Now there are plenty of quick time events throughout the game where the player must hit the correct input at the correct time, but most of the time, it really doesn't matter if you mess up. Miroslav Korda? Yeah? <laughs> Lieutenant Carter Blake, I'd like to ask you some questions. <laughs> Shit, don't just stand there, he's gonna get away! Stop that guy! <laughs> hey man, watch <laughs> me! Now that said, there are some moments which you absolutely must hit and some which are just beneficial if you do, but for the majority of the time, it's totally alright to get some wrong. Because at the end, if the player wants all three good guys to survive, there's really only like three things that they need to do. But all this brings the question, does Heavy Rain have a good story? Is the story being told good enough to keep the player invested? And thankfully, I think it does. For the most part. Up until the very end and a very specific moment this entire multi-hour video is about, the game manages to capture its audience throughout the entire runtime. It has some interesting moments and strange occurrences, and then it kind of just falls apart when you think about it for more than a minute but 95% of it is pretty good. Also, before we get into it, I am fully aware that there is technically a director's cut and it's not what I have here, but it literally does not change anything in the story. Even though that's not technically the version that I played, the story is the same. So let's talk about it. The story begins by following Ethan Mars waking up on the morning of his son, Jason's 10th birthday. This is more of a tutorial section where you're really just learning basic mechanics more than anything else, but no time to think about that because suddenly it's lunchtime when Mrs. Mars gets home with the two boys. Ethan spends some time playing with them before going in to eat, but uh oh, the family's pet bird is dead. No time to think about that either because it's suddenly the next day and the family is at the mall. While buying Jason a balloon from a clown so creepy even Pennywise would run away, the kid decides to wander off, and keeps wandering. Not only does he leave his dad, he goes to the other side of the mall, down to the first floor, and then out the entrance and across the street. 
Ethan of course is chasing after him this entire time and manages to catch up to him outside, but as Jason is crossing the street again, he doesn't see the oncoming car. In an effort to save his kid, Ethan jumps out between the two, but it's not enough and Jason dies from the accident. But somehow, despite being the one who actually gets hit by the car, Ethan is totally fine for the most part. Sort of. After waking up from a six month coma, Ethan feels so responsible for the death of Jason, he decides to divorce his wife for some reason and moves away to a small suburban home. Which might not seem like it makes sense, but is unfortunately quite common. Two years after the accident, Ethan is looking after his other son, Sean. When putting him to bed for the night, Ethan suddenly has a blackout, a side effect of the accident, or so we're told. He later wakes up far from home with an origami figure in his hand. The next day, Ethan is playing with Sean at the park when he experiences his second and final blackout. When he wakes up from this one, he discovers Sean has been kidnapped by the Origami Killer, a local serial killer who only targets young boys during fall and slowly drowns them in rainwater. After they die, he leaves an orchid on their chest and an origami figure nearby. So, it's especially concerning when Ethan once again woke up with another origami figure in his hand. At the same time, Norman Jaden, an FBI agent struggling with drug addiction, investigates the death of a previous victim using the help of an augmented reality tool named Ari. He's able to conclude the day the victim died, and using this and current weather patterns, aka, well, not heavy rain, but still a lot of rain, he predicts Sean only has about three days to live, which again is incorrect. When telling this to his new partner, Blake, Blake rages as if Norman wasn't sharing evidence and actual findings. Mobbed by reporters at his home, Ethan sneaks out, somehow going unnoticed by said mob and checks into a nearby motel. Now before he did so, he did receive a nonsensical letter from the killer, even though he didn't know it at the time, and it eventually leads to a shoebox containing a phone, gun, and five origami figures. Ethan is back at the motel when he's checking all of this out, so he plugs in this little SD card thing into the phone, which explains how all of this is going to go down. Each origami figure contains a trial he is to complete, each trial he completes reveals more of the address where Sean is being kept, and each trial will test him just a little further. Despite obviously not being the origami killer, for some reason Ethan thinks that he is, and that he is testing himself for some reason. Because of this, he decides to not go to the police with this extremely helpful information and instead takes on the trials entirely alone, the first of which requires him to take a car the killer has prepared for him and drive down the wrong side of the highway for five miles. He does, of course attracting the attention of the police, and ultimately crashes. Somehow though, he gets away and gets back to the motel where he meets Madison Page, a character we don't really learn much about for a very large portion of the game. It ends up, she's a journalist who is staying at the motel because of insomnia. Madison gets close to Ethan, helping him clean up his wound several times. While she was originally doing this to get to know Ethan and see if he actually was the killer, she eventually concludes he can't be and decides to figure out who the real killer actually is. Ethan, meanwhile, continues his trial, which involved crawling through the broken glass in the tunnels of an abandoned power facility, and then making his way through a maze of active electrical pylons, cutting off one of his fingers on camera, literally killing a man, and drinking poison on camera. Now, as all of this is going down, Norman and his absolute terrible piece of garbage pretending to be a human partner investigate suspects. AKA, quite literally, Blake thinks every single one of them is the killer, but ultimately, they keep coming up short no matter how much Blake police brutalities them. That is, until Grace, Ethan's ex-wife, makes her one and only appearance in this game after the prologue, just to incite suspicion onto Ethan, saying he was probably involved in the killings. Norman and Blake visit Ethan's psychiatrist, and thanks to a little bit more police brutality, they learn of Ethan's blackouts. Now, while Blake is absolutely certain yet again that they have found the right guy, like this time it's 100% serial, 100% certain, yo, to no surprise, Norman isn't convinced. At the same time as all of this... Private investigator Scott Shelby is meeting with several family members of the origami killer's victims. He's collecting various pieces of evidence, including a letter, phone, and an entire box similar to what Ethan has that that guy didn't think the police should know about for some reason either. 
Lady of the Night Lauren Winter, a mother of a victim, somehow persuades Scott to let her be his partner in his investigation, a decision which ultimately makes zero sense. Their personal investigation leads to a guy named Gordy Kramer, who is not on the police's radar, probably because it's ultimately revealed that while Gordy does have some serious issues, he's definitely not the killer. We actually learn who the killer is through some flashbacks, and depending on how you play the game and what choices you make, the various characters, except Ethan, can all figure it out in their own way. Okay, now there are a lot of different endings that you can get in this game, but for the sake of this summary, we're going to pretend that we get the best ending because that's the one you're technically supposed to get. So regardless of whether or not Ethan completes all five trials, he is able to determine the location Sean is being held at. He successfully gets there, only to be confronted by the origami killer himself. Yeah, it wasn't Ethan. That was kind of obvious from the beginning. The killer reveals that Ethan is the exact type of father he was looking for, one who would do anything, even die, to save their son. But when Ethan goes to take Sean from the sewage rain cell thingamabobber he was being kept in, the killer goes to, well, kill Ethan for some reason. Except, Madison shows up to save the day, and in more ways than one. Okay, so you see, Ethan gets to Sean by stealing a car, and the police find him. Blake, with a hard-on for ignoring any reason or logic, goes after him with a whole ton of backup, like way more than is necessary, but Norman, using evidence and clues, figures out who the real killer is. He also arrives on the scene and actually fights the real killer in plain view of the police, who somehow don't notice this, by the way, and it can ultimately lead to the killer dying. Now, despite Blake's orders to shoot Ethan the second he steps outside, thanks to Madison being there, the police just ignore that. They also don't arrest Ethan for the various illegal things he did, allowing him and Madison to start a new life together. Like I said, there are various different endings you can get, but that's the one we're going with for this video. Obviously, it's a little difficult to take a 12-hour experience and try to sum it up in just a few minutes. You'll notice things jumped around a lot, some characters were brought up only to disappear, certain other elements were met with the same fate, and you may have also noticed that, um, nothing happens. Like, things take place, but outside of Ethan's five trials, there aren't really any notable events. Part of that is because I intentionally left out some spoilery things for later, but most of it is because a lot of the confrontations and police brutalities ultimately don't matter. They are in the plot as placeholders and distractions, but not as progressions. Now, if you've played the game, you might be screaming at me asking what the hell am I talking about because of course things matter, there are action sequences and exciting moments, and yes, that is very true. Madison has an entire fight sequence, Norman has multiple and a chase sequence, there is plenty happening throughout the game. But when looking at how many of those sequences actually contribute to advancing the story in any meaningful way, which isn't many, or if you ask how many of them could have not been an action sequence and finished with the same result, the answer is most of them. Now, if you've played Heavy Rain before, you probably also noticed that I left out a lot from that synopsis. I didn't talk about what Madison does in her investigation or how she ultimately finds out who the killer is. I didn't really talk about all the various leads that Norman investigates or just how terrible of a human being that Blake is and how copy-paste every single one of those chapters ends up being because of it. I also didn't talk about who Gordy is or the interactions with his father, escaping the sinking car, or literally anything to do with Baco. Because at the end of the game, when all of that is said and done, none of it is important. I mean, we're still going to talk about it, but hopefully you'll see what I mean when we do. Because just like the various genres that can be used to describe Heavy Rain, the various plot elements do work well together, but when looked at individually, they aren't really able to stand on their own. They're not a natural sequence of events that take place, but instead mere individual moments that are awkwardly stitched together in such a way that you don't really notice. Because, yeah, the overall story of Heavy Rain is pretty good. 
until you start putting thought into it, and especially when you think about the twist. Because, oh yeah, there's a twist. I first saw The Sixth Sense when I was about five or six years old. I remember watching it at home with my mom, and I was at that age where suspension of disbelief isn't really a thing because I didn't understand the concept of acting and was questioning everything still as I was trying to understand the world. In other words, everything was real. When Bruce Willis's character, because let's be honest, no one remembers his name, gets shot at the beginning of the film, I questioned how he didn't die, because to six-year-old me, getting shot meant death. Now, this is a question that the movie also intentionally doesn't answer immediately. But, at the end of the film, when it's revealed that Bruce Willis's character was actually dead the entire time, I remember thinking, well, yeah, he got shot. So, six-year-old me accidentally ruined one of the greatest movie twists of all time. But my mom, on the other hand, was completely blown away. To a lot of people, a good twist is one that is believable within the logic that is established. In other words, it just needs to make sense, like Bioshock. Or it's one where all the puzzle pieces were laid out, allowing the audience to piece it together themselves, like in The Sixth Sense. Personally, I don't think being able to figure out the twist is that important, more so that the pieces are there and can be found upon further reflection. In either case, it can't just come out of nowhere and leave you confused. But that said, in my opinion, a great twist is one you didn't even see coming, even if the pieces are there. For me, it's much more impactful and much more satisfying to look back upon the story and see all of the elements that were missed. YouTuber Tyler Mowry has a great video talking about how to build a meaningful twist. And the main focus of the video is how a great twist will take three elements present in every story and change all three. The external, the internal, and the philosophical shifts. External shifts rearrange plot elements in a way that is unexpected. These are surprises that happen to the external elements of the story. For instance, something like an unexpected death or an identity being revealed. This has nothing to do with character beliefs or conflict. An internal shift has to do with the emotion a character is feeling. Like in the famous Darth Vader reveal, Luke goes from a state of peace to a state of shock and disbelief. Now, it doesn't always have to be from good to bad. It can be the other way around too, but it must be clear and it cannot leave the audience confused. And finally, a philosophical shift is a change in how the audience perceives the theme of the story. Not necessarily a change in the theme, but in the perception of the theme. Big Hero 6 is a movie that people seem to have just forgotten about. I don't know, I thought it was good. It also has a good twist, but not a great one, because it only has an external and internal shift, but no philosophical shift. See, when it's revealed that Professor Callahan actually killed Tadashi and has been working on his plan ever since, the external shift has Hiro going from thinking that Tadashi was killed in a fire to realizing Tadashi was actually killed by his mentor. For the internal shift, Hiro is frustrated, becomes Hiro feels betrayed. But the theme of the movie doesn't change. Death hurts people stays as death hurts people. Meanwhile, in The Sixth Sense, all three elements are met. The external shift is, well, the obvious one. Bruce Willis's character is revealed to have been dead the whole time. Internally, he goes from thinking that he was helping the kid and has been struggling with his wife to realizing 
that he's been helping himself and his wife has been mourning him, and philosophically, the movie goes from Bruce Willis is helping Cole understand his connection to the dead, to Cole was helping Bruce Willis understand his connection to being dead. We see what we want to see. Another one of the reasons that these two reveals have completely different impacts is because of the construction of the story around them. In Big Hero 6, before the reveal that the villain is Professor Callahan, there isn't really anything in the movie that sets it up. Someone watching the movie a second time won't really pick up any clues because they're not really there. So even though one might not see the twist coming, it's because there isn't anything helping build to it. But in The Sixth Sense, a second viewing reveals a lot of the puzzle pieces that are easily missed the first time around. Because you didn't even realize that you were putting a puzzle together in the first place. So what happens when you are aware that there is a puzzle, and you do see the pieces, but when you're about to finish, you're told that the image you were supposed to create was entirely different and not the one on the box. Well... Now, I promise I will say what the twist is and actually talk about it, but in order to fully understand just how illogical it really is, we need to take a more thorough look at the story that comes before and surrounds it. We're not going to look at the full 12-hour experience, just most of it, but we are going to look at the whole story, just skipping through some smaller things that don't really matter. As mentioned earlier, the game starts, because yeah, we do actually need to start at the beginning, with Ethan waking up. They live in a nice home, you learn the basic mechanics, play with Ethan's two sons, all that stuff that I talked about earlier. But remember how I said that the family's pet bird was dead? It's a really weird moment in the game, even if it is an important one. Sean? What's up? It's Merlin. He's dead. He's dead and it's all my fault. No, it's not, Sean. Of course it's not your fault. I'd give anything if you could come back to life. You know, Sean, there's some things which just have to happen, even if you don't want them to. It brings the opening scene to a complete halt as there's a whole scene with it. Everything before was a super happy moment, and then it's immediately forgotten about and never mentioned again. At all. In any way. Even though it's supposed to be important. Apparently, the bird dying was meant to foreshadow the incoming death of Jason, which... <laughs> My life has come to an end. But... When you have the opening of what is obviously going to be an incredibly sad game be super happy, it kind of already foreshadows that. However, according to the developers of the game, Sean blaming himself for what happened to the bird is an allusion to how Ethan blames himself for Jason's death. Stretch Armstrong, now stretching farther than ever before! This moment in the game serves as a way to set up one of the themes of Heavy Rain. There's some things which just have to happen, even if you don't want them to. Which is extremely true. However, a theme is not something that just shows up once and then is immediately forgotten about. The theme of the original Iron Man movie isn't how good burgers are. With the bird never being brought up again in any way, it gets lost in all of the events which follow. Even though, as we'll see, the theme still does hold true in the end. As it is now, though, it's just a completely random scene. But it didn't have to be. One simple fix could have helped this scene have more of an impact in the overall story. When Ethan takes his family to the mall the next day, they could have just said it's to get a new bird. It's that simple. That way there's actually a story reason for both moments instead of just being a thing that happens. The story really starts in the next scene where Jason ultimately dies. 
However, as someone with 20 years of writing experience, this scene just doesn't work. Anyone with two brain cells likely saw the death coming, which, fine, they're not really trying to hide it. But that's not the problem. It's pretty clear that the writers of Heavy Rain knew Jason would get hit by a car, but didn't really put much thought into how he would get there, which as I said earlier is by wandering away from Ethan. But he doesn't just like wander off and then is suddenly outside, no he goes to the complete other side of the mall, down the escalator, back across the mall, and then outside, and then across the street all while Ethan is desperately chasing after him, continuously calling out to him. Jason! Jason! As I mentioned earlier, the story of Heavy Rain is the biggest factor when it comes to enjoyment. The trick to a good story is to have the audience forget whatever it is that they are doing to experience that story. A good author will have the reader forget that they are reading, a good movie will have you forget your eyes are glued to the screen, you should remember to blink by the way, and any time they fail to do that, you're more likely to stop and just go do something else. So when you start your game with a moment that is nothing more than a two second sequence on repeat for five minutes, you're really taking the risk of players putting down the controller and playing something else. Moments like this are where the story of Heavy Rain starts to crumble, and we just started. But in all fairness, one of the challenges with making interactive games is making sure that the player actually has something to do, otherwise there's no point in it being a game. So the question becomes, when do you have the player do something, and when is it just a cutscene instead? In this instance, so early on, the player needed to be doing something. Some sort of interaction was still very much required at this point in order to get the player invested. I just don't think that this was done the right way. Jason running through the entire mall, going outside and crossing the street isn't really believable. Wandering off and leaving Ethan? Yeah, kids wander off all the time. Going to a completely different floor of the mall while their father is calling out to them the entire time? Okay, that's starting to push it just a little bit. Somehow escaping the chasing father the entire time and making it outside and across the street? No. If Ethan hadn't caught up to Jason when he did, the kid would be halfway to China. And it ruins the immersion. Because the chase went on so long, it stopped being suspenseful and instead became tediously annoying. And at that point, it wasn't a surprise that Jason died, even if they weren't trying to hide it. It was an inevitability that came five minutes too late. And seeing how important this moment is to the overall plot as the moment which sets all else into action, this moment absolutely needed to work. It could have worked too, with some minor tweaks that keep it believable and end with the same result. The first change that I would make is to have the world's creepiest clown just start on the first floor. Right away, that eliminates most of the problems. Jason can still wander off, but now you're not chasing him through half the mall. Instead, maybe when he's walking by the front entrance, he loses the grip on his balloon. Or better yet, just have that be the reason he wanders off to start with. You know, Jason could be chasing after the balloon the whole time, and then it makes sense for him to be ignoring his dad's call. Either way, the balloon would end up flying outside, and being a kid, Jason would chase after it and not see the car coming. Same outcome, but a much more believable route. Now, I would also personally make one more small change to this scene, but let me ask you something first. If Ethan jumps between Jason and the car, which he does, I think it's safe to say that Ethan takes the brunt of the impact, right? So how does he walk away relatively unscathed, but Jason dies? Like, I know Ethan was in a coma and that's where the whole blackouts come from supposedly, but it's very, 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 very weird to see that scene happen, to literally see Ethan jump out and get hit by the car, 
And then in the very next moment, Ethan is totally fine. Like, this moment is meant to set up something extremely important to the story and to the twist, which I still haven't forgotten about. But it doesn't really work in isolation. If the impact was enough to kill Jason, Ethan probably should have died too, or have had some sort of serious injuries. Or at least some actual lasting side effects. But instead, he's basically totally okay. And how it is now causes a few too many unnecessary questions that players definitely notice. And if players are asking questions that they shouldn't be, they're losing that immersion. So instead of thinking about what would have actually happened and trying to write something new that worked, the writers seem to have just hoped that no one would have noticed. This scene was designed this way for the sake of the twist. This scene was designed this way for the sake of the twist, but just like how Jason gets to the street in the first place, it's frustrating to think about for more than a second because you realize that they never really cared to have the small things make sense. So because of that, the one final change I would have made to this scene is to have Ethan almost jump but not actually do it. And remember that, because we're gonna come back to it in about an hour. It's no secret that the Hobbit trilogy ended up being quite a mess. Now other people have covered this far more extensively than I can, and the short of it is that due to a variety of different reasons, a lot of the movies were quite literally being put together on set. Things were such a mess that one of the major elements of the entire trilogy gets completely dropped with zero resolution. Thorin's quest for the Arkenstone is a pretty big driving force throughout the films, and then in the Battle of Five Armies, it just disappears. It's just... gone. Its fate is revealed in the extended edition for those who are curious, but in the theatrical version, this incredibly important plot point just gets completely forgotten about. So, after waking up from a six month coma, Ethan is now experiencing blackouts, and while it is plural, it's not much more than that. Had the game done what I suggested, having Ethan not jump in front of the car, he wouldn't have any blackouts, but how the game stands now, the more of a means to an end and not really an aspect of Ethan's life anyway. In the entire game, Ethan only ever experiences two blackouts. That's it. They take place basically one right after the other and both happen extremely early on in the game. The first blackout happens when Ethan puts Sean to bed for the night, and the second the very next day after Ethan picks him up from school. This is a scene where Sean gets kidnapped, but after that moment, that's it. They're never talked about or brought up again, except when Norman and Blake figure out about them through some police brutality. But other than that, that's it. If the writers wanted this to be a component of Ethan's life, a challenge to overcome throughout the game, then it would have stuck around and been an obstacle. Like, imagine trying to complete one of the five trials only to black out. The problem is that this of course wouldn't be fair to the players. Blacking out during one of the trials would mean not getting the vital information needed to save Sean. And if a player is doing everything they can to achieve that outcome, then losing their chance because of something entirely outside of their control isn't really fair. Which is exactly why it doesn't happen. It can't happen in those moments. And since it can't slash doesn't happen in those moments, that means it really only exists for Sean to get kidnapped. And if it only exists for Sean to get kidnapped and isn't present in the other 90% of the story, then it's nothing more than a poorly written aspect of the game that should not have been included. After all, Tony Stark doesn't just make weapons as a way to get to the Middle East in the story. It's a huge part of what transforms him into Iron Man. Consider that at the end of this story, after it's all said and done, Ethan does not get cured. The damage from the car accident does not go away. He doesn't magically get better. He would still very much be a liability. It just never gets brought up again though, and you're not really supposed to think about it. 
almost like it's not important. Now, there was an explanation written, but it got removed. So canonically, as it stands, Ethan would not be cured. Now, the entire reason for the blackouts is to make the player believe that Ethan might be the origami killer. And to make Ethan believe it as well, I guess. Except, and partly because, as I said, an explanation for the blackouts was actually written and originally parts of the game before ultimately being cut. See, originally, when Ethan had his blackouts, he would find himself in a nightmare-like sequence. He would be lost in the ruins of a house that is underwater. Ethan would swim around aimlessly until he came upon the body of a child, which is one of the victims of the killer. He would then wake up in Carnaby Square with an origami figure in his hand. Both sequences were originally playable moments, though even with them, the origami and Carnaby Square aspects weren't ever explained. It's not really a plot hole, it's just bad writing. Now these sequences were cut in order to speed up the start of the game, recenter the narration, and anchor the story in reality. In aspect, they kind of forget in the rest of the game. See, the reason that these nightmare sequences and blackouts were happening is because Ethan would be accessing the origami killer's mind in the moments that he, the killer, is killing slash hurting children. That is what is actually happening and why they don't take place after Sean is kidnapped. Because after Sean is kidnapped, the killer isn't really doing anything that would trigger this occurrence. Now, there is a reason for this connection between Ethan and the killer, but we'll get into that much later. Removing the explanation of the blackouts should have been followed by removing the blackouts entirely. Since they only happen twice in the game anyway, it wouldn't really change much. But it would leave the question of how Sean even gets kidnapped. But here's the thing. That's still very much a question that the game does not answer as it is. They weren't in a private place. There were a lot of other people there. Someone should have seen something. But again, the game never actually brings any attention to it. Now, I know we get a possible explanation much later in the game, but even if that is what happens, and we'll talk about it when we get there, someone would have seen it. See, the next day when Sean's disappearance is all over the news, someone would have noticed. But then we wouldn't have a game. But that's the trick of writing, figuring out how to make those things work. For example, if you take my choice to have Ethan not jump in front of the car, then he would be living in the world of what if. What if he had jumped? Could he have saved Jason? But because of this, because of the trauma associated with watching his son die, certain things would trigger him. And the trigger could be something as simple as a car blaring its horn and slamming on its brakes. This could remind Ethan of the moment that Jason died, sending him into a panic where he loses control and wanders off. You can get rid of the weird origami connection and him waking up in Carnaby Square. Just have him have like a panic attack and run off. Keep things simple. Now this would leave Sean on the carousel wondering where his dad is. It's revealed later on in the story that the origami killer would lure kids by dressing as a police officer. And we already know that he was present at the carousel, so maybe Sean would approach him for help, only to end up being kidnapped. Which again, someone would have still noticed. But Sean getting kidnapped is a huge aspect of the entire game. It is the inciting incident to the story of Ethan for the rest of this game. It is why there is a game at all. This is the bigger issue with removing the explanation for the blackouts. Since they're meant to happen in a moment where the origami killer is doing something bad, and the second one happens when Sean gets kidnapped, having the explanation lets the scene make sense. Removing the explanation means that the cause and effect are now flipped and no longer work. Instead of Ethan blacking out because the origami killer is kidnapping Sean, now Sean gets kidnapped because Ethan blacks out. You cannot add something into your game that affects a huge moment 
and then get rid of it, but not the effects it had. Go Blue Team! The five trials that Ethan is asked to complete are absolutely illogical in any realistic world like the ones that the developers are going for. Now, I'm not that cynical. I understand that this is a game. But when you remove an entire element for the sake of realism, I expect the rest of that game to then match that realism. This is a fantasy game. No one would be able to survive all five trials, much less over the course of three days, and much, much less while being pursued by the cops. Not to mention that if he had survived, he would still be spending a whole lot of time behind bars. I mean, we're talking trespassing, resisting arrests, reckless endangerment, and of course, operating a zeppelin on school premises. Sorry, not operating a zeppelin on school premises. I meant to say murder! As I said, I get the trials are because this is a game. I get that. There is nothing inherently wrong with any individual trial except one. Instead, it's the combination of having to do all five and some simpler aspects about them that don't really hold up to scrutiny. But the most illogical aspect of them is Ethan not talking to the police. Like in the game, even though it's not really ever stated outright, the reason Ethan doesn't go to the police is because he thinks he's the origami killer testing himself. Now, as I said, him believing he's the killer is stated. Him not going to the police because of that is just implied. It's almost like that whole aspect was only included to deceive the player. I can see why someone in this position might not want to go to the police, but there's the really big problem that he already did. The police are well aware of Sean's kidnapping. I mean, remember Norman? So even if Ethan actually was the killer and finds Sean, it's not like he's getting off scot-free. This is another reason why I think it would have made more sense for Ethan to not have jumped at the beginning of the game, living in that regret and in the world of what-ifs, because when he opens the box, sees the video, and then the trials, he would have been presented with the chance to banish the demons that had been haunting him every single day since he froze and let his son die. He would have been presented with the opportunity to do something, to do everything, to save his son. Then, it would make sense for him not to go to the police, because then the trials are something he absolutely has to do on his own. But that's not what happens. That's not what Ethan is like. Instead, in the world of the game we did get, Ethan really should have told somebody what was going on. Like, even if the police couldn't help him directly with the trials, they certainly could have helped him in a variety of other ways, much needed medical attention being the least of which. So much is involved with each of these trials, the police could have used the information and evidence in their effort to find the killer. And what's really funny is that is exactly what Madison does and how she finds where to go. Now, imagine instead of a journalist trying to find out that information, you have the people who are actually trained to do that. Anyway, the first trial asks Ethan to go to a garage and get a car that's been sitting there for two years, being maintained the whole time. I feel like the paper trail behind that would definitely be helpful to finding a mysterious killer. Ethan is told to drive on the wrong side of the highway for five miles, something which he immediately goes and does. Come on! Fuck. 
Again, it's a game, so he survives, but he does get pretty banged up during it. After driving the five miles, he is told the first part of the address to where Sean is being held is in the glove compartment. Now, while he did check before driving, it was locked. And the more I think about some of these trials, the less they make sense. We'll talk about why in a little bit though. The second trial is the only one that's outright unbelievable in every single aspect. One call to the police would surely have led to enough information to find the origami killer, if for no other reason than because it takes place at a supposedly abandoned power plant. Which isn't the kind of thing that you just get up and running anonymously. Someone would have noticed. I also find it really funny to think that the origami killer was crawling backwards through these pipe tunnel things, laying down all the glass. Once you know who the killer is, that mental image is really dumb. But not as dumb as not sweeping the glass outside. Like, you really don't have to crawl through it. That was, that was a choice, not a necessity. But that's not even the dumbest part of this trial. After crawling through all the glass and potentially finding one of the previous fathers, which means that these locations are continuously used and not one-time things, Ethan must make his way through a maze of active electrical pylons. Something which surely took some time to set up, and definitely doesn't go unnoticed. Now, this is one of those things that would just be impossible. Not just the setup, but the actual doing. But I find it even more hilarious how Ethan just walks away at the end. Like, after he gets through it all, he just leaves through another door. Which means that there was another way he could have taken. Now I hear what you're saying. Maybe he had to go in the way he did. The other way was probably locked or something. But then how did he get out? Oh, the origami killer was watching. Like, he would have known that Ethan came in and cheated. Was he, though? We'll get back to that. The third trial sees Ethan going to a random apartment where he has five minutes to use one of the various tools laying around to cut off a finger in front of a camera that is recording him. Only after he does so will he be given more of the address. Now in terms of why is he being asked to do this, how far will he go to save Sean, I think it's an interesting challenge. Is he willing to risk a permanent change to his body for his son? Now this sequence is one of the more tense ones in the game because if you don't do it in time, you'll fail the challenge and get less of the address you're trying to find. It was actually probably my favorite trial. However, tending to a cutoff finger isn't as simple as slapping a bandaid on the wound. Like serious medical attention is required not only to stop the loss of blood, but also to prevent infections, further complications, and not to mention that he's probably dealing with a whole ton of shock something we do sort of see when Madison shows up to help him, which is great, but then it's kind of forgotten about by the next trial. Similarly to the first, when Ethan does cut off a finger, he's told the next part of the address is under the floor beneath the table, which really makes me think he probably should take a look around first. So let's pause for a second and ask, what if he had what if, when he got the car, he managed to get the glove compartment open and found the address? Would the killer have known? There wouldn't really be anything forcing Ethan to still complete the trial then. The address was already in the box he already had. This doesn't really matter because, well, game, the second, and as we'll see, fourth trials are the only two where the clue for the address is hidden somewhere for Ethan to find, and I mean, if Ethan had found the back entrance to the power plant, I guess he could have just taken the chip for the second trial too, but anyway. It's heavily implied that the origami killer is watching during at least some of these trials, including the third, but what if when looking around, Ethan happens to find the chip? Two out of two have been physically there, given as a reward for completing what was asked. Ethan would likely be aware the third is in that room somewhere. So what happens if he does find it? It's really weird to have a phone be the connection between the killer and Ethan and not have that matter. So like, why is he given chips? Why not just a text or a call? Especially since Ethan is not going to the police. It just adds extra steps and complications. And what happens if one of the chips doesn't work? Like, 
I know and, and I get that I'm overthinking this, but if the developers wanted a realistic game, these questions should be asked. You can't just include elements for the sake of including them. But let's get back to the game. The fourth trial sees Ethan tasked with killing a man. That's it. You're given the address to the guy's apartment and then you can either do it or not. I don't really have anything else to say about this one. I mean, sure, attempted murder slash murder would definitely still be a charge, especially since Ethan is shown on the news and if you don't kill the guy, he'd probably see that. But the actual trial is still the most straightforward one. The fifth trial, which is also pretty simple, has Ethan drink poison on camera, which like, again, would probably lead right back to the killer for multiple reasons. Saw 2 released in 2005 in it, there is a transmission going in which the police trace back to a location after a few hours. Obviously, this is a movie about a psychotic killer sending someone through trials in order to save their son, which is completely different than a game about a psychotic killer sending someone through trials in order to save their son. But the point being, the police would have been able to trace back these live feed cameras, especially if they are in continuously used places like the power plant indicates. Instead, upon completing all five trials, if you finish all five, you get the full address to find Sean. If you didn't complete all five, say if you had a little bit of morality and didn't kill the random guy, you don't get the full address. But you do get way more than enough to be able to figure it out. It's a little bit of a crapshoot, but it's not that hard. Now, the last three trials are really good even the weird murder one. Like, sure, I'm criticizing it, but it fits in the theme of the other two. Is Ethan willing to permanently harm himself? Is Ethan willing to kill for Sean? Is Ethan willing to die for Sean? The first two trials don't really work with that. In trial one, is Ethan willing to die for Sean? Okay, but then there's the poison one later, so that's not really needed then. Or is it asking if he's willing to put others in danger? Well, then you have the murder trial. It really feels like the writers had three solid ideas, but for some reason wanted five. I'm not saying the first trial is bad or rushed, it's actually quite fun to play through, but in the motif of the trials, it doesn't really have a place. The second trial is very similar. Is Ethan willing to hurt himself a little bit and then die? I'm sure you can see the problem that arises with this. If the question is always, is Ethan willing to die for Sean, then the final trial doesn't really have a place or the shock that it's meant to have, because the answer is already yes. It's been yes since he got in that car. Oh, but he's not meant to die in those trials. Sure, but he doesn't know that. And realistically, he would. Which makes it all the more baffling when, after the trials, Ethan does find Sean and the killer congratulates him on being a father willing to die for their son. Something which we'll talk much more about when we get to the twist. Ethan's story in Heavy Rain revolves entirely around these trials. Now, while you do have those first few sections with him, once the trial starts, that's the only time you play as him and when he's running from the cops. Otherwise, whenever you see him, you're playing as Madison. I started my creative writing journey when I was only eight years old, even though I had done some like smaller scraps and poems before then. Now for years, I had put my foot in the water and was just building up ideas. My very first story was about 9-11. And yes, I am still working on that super deep dive. But I quickly moved on to writing science fiction in what I thought was comedy. It was bad. And I would show you it, but I don't know where they are. I started my delve into science fiction by writing a completely serious, yet at the same time, absolute parody of all things science fiction, but mainly Star Wars. I mean, my main character's name was Yannikin, so yeah, and this is where I would show you him, if I had that. But yeah, it wasn't really good, 
and it didn't have to be. Even if Little Me had grand delusions of one day publishing these stories, it was more of a way for me to start writing and begin learning on how to do certain things. No one masters it the first time around, so even though they were terribly written, I'm equally incredibly thankful to have written them at all. I mean, the first book was only 11 pages. This script, as it is currently, in the words that I am speaking right now, has been longer than that. I wouldn't be here without starting where I did. And to get here, I had to make many mistakes. And in about the fourth or fifth book, around the time that I was only 13, I was writing what I thought was a super clever sequence. The main character, I'm not saying that name again, had to fly into an enemy ship to save his wife. But he gets surrounded and the self-destruct is about to go off. He's quickly running out of time and then realizes that he can't save his wife, but then he wakes up. Yeah, I thought I was being really clever, subverting expectations as some poor storytellers might say. Later, I would learn just how bad of a trope this actually is to use. I mean, the only ever movie to successfully use the it was all a dream trope is Inception, and that's because it's not actually using that trope. So why is it so bad? When it was all a dream happens, everything that came before no longer matters. Any tension that might have been built up was false and ultimately unearned. Any danger that the characters were in ends up being completely meaningless. Oftentimes, unless the idea is specifically to convey the internal feelings of a character or a potential premonition of future events, the trope should just not be used. It ends up distancing your audience from the characters and what is happening because it makes it feel like they were just cheated. If the character wakes up from a dream and finds themselves in more action, have they really? Or is it also just a dream as well? The audience will always question it. I mean, just look at how many they were always in the Matrix theories are still floating around. Now, we're first introduced to Madison Page in the 11th chapter of the game, In Her Apartment, a location that we never come back to. The very first thing we see is her waking up on the couch, likely from a nightmare. That, or I've just never woken up properly before. It's just before 3am, and, well, this is as great of a time as any to talk about one of the major gameplay problems with Heavy Rain, and quite honestly, all of Quantic Dream's games. There are far too many times where it's not clear what it is you have to do because you're not given any sort of direction at all. Keep in mind, this is not an open world choose your own adventure game. In those, you can wander around without direction and you would find something to do. But that's not the case in Heavy Rain. But I'm also not saying that our hands should be held the entire way, just that some sort of guidance should be given. Even in the games when you think it's not there, it is. For instance, Dark Souls doesn't necessarily have a quest marker or anything, but you can also quickly find out that the objective is always forward. What I mean in this case is that this game gives you nothing. I actually think it's worse in Beyond Two Souls because there are consequences in that game, but that's a different video for a different time. In Heavy Rain, after Madison wakes up, the player is only given three options. Check the time, turn off the TV, or stand up. And once you do eventually stand up, Madison doesn't say or do anything. She just stands there. There's no indication of anything to do. You're just there. Now, you can start interacting with items in the apartment, but it really feels like it's all just wasting time because there's no direction here. There's not really anything happening. It doesn't feel like there's a point. It's just hitting buttons, 
waiting for something to happen. And sure, in this particular playthrough, interacting with the magazine triggers this creepy POV camera, but then seconds later, you can clearly see that there's nothing there. I mean, you can even go into the bedroom and see that it's completely empty. Except it's not. Or is it? This is why this section is really strange, because even though something is technically happening, at the same time, absolutely nothing is. Trying to figure out what is happening, if anything, isn't fun, because absolutely nothing works. You're just going to try the next thing that pops up to get something to take place, for some event to happen. Like, even trying to go back to sleep, again, leads to nothing. You have to get up and keep interacting with random things. Again, this isn't fun, it's not immersive, and it's not how you tell a story. I mentioned this earlier with being able to sit on the chair in the hotel room and how it's boring, but this opening segment with Madison takes that to the absolute extreme. Now you can interact with so many things, but none of them progress this chapter forward or tell you anything about Madison. But John, I hear you say, that's the point. You're supposed to live this like a normal person would. And besides, you can always hear her thoughts and get some sort of idea. Yeah, I haven't forgotten about that mechanic, but we'll get into it later. Ultimately, the only real way to progress the segment is to go into the bathroom and do something, anything, then just come back out. At this point, Madison finds that the fridge has been left open, which she definitely didn't do, and then, oh no, she's now being attacked by someone. Wait, no, sorry, three people. Do I sound enthused because I'm, 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 I'm not, but don't worry, because Madison is a fighter. She fends for herself, kicking and punching, and ultimately making her way back into the bathroom again, where she gets grabbed and has her throat slit. But it was all a dream. Okay, what was the point of all that? If you say it was for the player to have something to do, then okay, write a better scene. Preferably one that's actually relevant to the story? Well, you could say that it's showing that she has insomnia, and yeah, I kind of get that, but it doesn't show that at all because it's almost 3 in the morning and not only do a lot of people tend to wake up in the middle of the night anyway, I think any human would wake up after having that dream. Which, by the way, was literally everything we just saw. When Madison wakes up for real, the TV is still on. Which means everything after the first fake wake up was a dream. Like, everything. She had a dream where she woke up, which is already very weird, walked around her apartment doing various boring tasks, tried to go back to sleep, which is also weird, went to the bathroom, and then got attacked by three random guys and died. What kind of dream is that? Problem number two is that dreams don't work this way, but that's also a different video for a different day. Problem number three, which is the most important one, is that it's just a pretty boring dream. I mean, have you ever had a dream where you're just living your normal everyday life? Like, I have, but even then, there are still very distinct dreamlike elements involved. It's not a one-for-one -one recreation of real life, because that's not how dreams work. And considering that this is the player's very first introduction to Madison, coming in twice as late as any of the other characters, having a boring, useless scene like this does not set a good tone. And, depending on how you play the game, this could be the only action sequence you get with Madison at all, and it's wasted on something that, like I said, literally doesn't matter. But in all fairness, she definitely suffered the most from the cutting room floor. Where Ethan only had two sections cut, Madison had pretty much everything about her removed. 
As I mentioned earlier, the player doesn't learn Madison is a journalist until quite a good bit into the game, like after the fourth trial into the game. But originally, there were supposed to be sections where the player would go to a newspaper office to do research, write articles, and all that kind of stuff. You know, things that would help flesh out a character we know nothing about. We would even learn that Madison's insomnia comes from her past as she was a journalist during the war in Iraq. Which may sound like PTSD, but traumatic events can absolutely cause insomnia as well. So here's my question. Why not just use that instead? Instead of a completely random and irrelevant dream fight sequence, why not a pseudo flashback sequence instead? Why not have the opening section with Madison be a flashback to her time in Iraq, maybe dealing with a similar sequence or something where she had to fight off some assailants, and then have her wake up from that? This way, we get an internal emotional conflict going on and an immediate explanation as to who this character is. Instead, she's just a random person throughout most of the game who doesn't really belong. And I'm saying that as someone who actually enjoyed her sections. But just like Ethan and his blackouts, now this is a similar experience to Ethan and his blackouts. Once the explanation for them was removed, the blackouts themselves should have been too. In similar fashion, when it comes to Madison's backstory, once that was removed from the game, she probably should have been taken out too, at least as a playable character. Now, I personally don't think that this would have been the right choice, and besides, the decision to remove her backstory came very late into development. So, the other option that could have been taken, and would have been much easier, was just to remove her being a journalist especially since it doesn't really matter at all, and the actions that she takes aren't really what a journalist does anyway. Because her whole backstory was removed, we lose the explanation to Madison's insomnia, and since the reason for the insomnia was never included, it's no longer a part of her character and becomes nothing more than a reason for her to leave her home and go stay at a motel for some reason. Now while I do have a lot of trouble sleeping, I don't have insomnia, so maybe this works. But the game certainly doesn't try to hide how strange it is, especially since the only explanation given is, don't ask me why. No, I live in town. I suffer from chronic insomnia. I seem to only be able to sleep in motels, don't ask me why. So I'm guessing the developers didn't really know either. but. Also, outside of just one mention to Ethan, it's literally never brought up again. It has zero relevance to the overall story or even to Madison's character. She literally could have just been someone at the motel and that would have been totally fine. Again, just more reason for the journalist thing to have been dropped. Instead, we have to have some weird explanation that's not really an explanation to justify Madison even getting to the motel. So which motel does she end up staying at anyway? Room 201. Last floor, stairs on the right in the courtyard. Stairs on the right in the courtyard.
In the world's greatest coincidence, she ends up staying at the same motel as Ethan. Yeah, remember back in the synopsis when I said Madison was originally getting close to Ethan to see if he was the killer or not? She didn't know that he was there at first. It is literally a coincidence that they meet. I mean, yeah, sure, she probably started the investigation after learning that he was Ethan Mars, but we don't actually know that for sure. What we do know, thanks to Shelby's storyline, is that there are other hotels in the area. So this is quite literally just a coincidence. Once again, making the whole journalist thing just really weird. I mean, it would have made more sense if she did know that he was there. Maybe we spot her in the crowd outside of Ethan's house. Maybe she sees him leaving because, like, someone would have seen him leaving. But no. Instead, she just happens to go where he is. Coincidences do not happen in writing. They're a cheap and bad way of making things take place. Now, in all fairness, Madison meets Ethan almost immediately upon arriving at the hotel, but she does act like she has no idea who he is. Probably because she has no idea who he is. Even though the players don't know it in the moment, she even goes so far as to lie to Ethan when he asks what her occupation is, which is Weird, because this only serves to try and fool the player for the journalist reveal later. Because in-universe, Madison does not know that she is with Ethan Mars until after this moment when she is leaving the room. There is literally no reason for her to lie here. It is just to deceive the player. And this is where the character's thoughts aspect first comes into play. One of the mechanics of this game is to be able to hear what the characters are thinking. The player learns this almost immediately when starting the game, as it's supposed to guide the player towards what they should be doing. It's not my favorite mechanic, in part because the literal execution of how it is on screen is just pretty bad. Like, do they have to be floating around like that? Do they have to be shaking? Sometimes, more often than not as well, it's just random and unhelpful anyway. First, people think weird things in weird ways, so recreating that one for one in a game isn't really ever going to happen, but that's a story for a different time. But more importantly, it's also never really about other characters, except for when the thought is something like, I should find Ethan to tell him this. Whenever you're playing as Madison, her thoughts are never about investigating Ethan or what it is that she is really doing. And again, this only serves to trick the player, something we see again as this mechanic also affects the twist. Still haven't forgotten about it. Now, it doesn't help that out of the 50-ish chapters that this game has, Madison is only playable in 10, which is extra weird because one of those chapters she's in is that opening sequence at her apartment, which does not count since 99% of it was fake anyway, and one of those chapters is just meeting Ethan. And then we don't see her again until after the second trial, where Madison plays nurse and once again treats his wounds. And this is something that's actually really important to mention, and I really need you to understand. While I'm telling the individual plot lines as continuous events, they are anything but that. Each timeline is intermingled throughout the entire story. Sometimes you don't see characters for five or six chapters at a time, so when they come around again, you've completely forgotten what it is that you were last doing with them. Madison's chapters, being so few, are definitely the most inconsistent, as she's once again just gone until after the third trial, where she helps Ethan escape from the police. Now, there's a small detail here that I really needed to point out, as it shows once again the lack of thought put into certain story elements. This moment shows that they definitely had an idea of what they wanted to execute, 
but kind of forgot that the rest of the world continues to exist. At the start of this chapter, attention is brought to the fact that Norman and Blake clearly see Madison. This is not a minor thing at all, it is quite literally the focus of the moment. She arrives to the apartment of the third trial on her motorcycle and then goes inside to help Ethan. The police clearly see this. And when escaping from the police shortly thereafter, which obviously consists of more than just Norman and Blake, Madison and Ethan do not escape on that motorcycle. They instead run across the street into the subway and take a train away. But the very next time we see Madison, she has her motorcycle again. For some reason. And it's never explained why or how, so I guess we're just left to assume that the police didn't really care about the supposed accomplice to who they thought was the origami killer, and they just let her come back to get her bike. Like, I know I said that was a small detail, but it's really not. See, they removed an entire section of this game, an entire explanation to certain events because they wanted to keep it grounded in realism, and yet they don't have realistic things happen. Like, sure, the police in this game are pretty incompetent, but they still would have taken her bike away. Or maybe they do let her come back for it and they follow her to where she goes. You know, just something other than completely ignoring this? Now, to be fair, like I said, the police in this game are absolutely incompetent and I'm giving them way too much credit. Because, after all, it is Madison, not the police, who is the one that wonders how Ethan even got to that apartment and starts investigating it. This, which takes place in the 34th chapter of the game by the way, is the first time that the player sees the investigative side of Madison. It comes so late in the game, it actually feels really out of place, despite being exactly what she's supposed to be. But since the journalistic work aspect was completely cut, we don't know that she is actually in her element here. But she is, and she investigates the apartment, eventually tracing it back to a man called the Doc. He is a former surgeon who writes illegal drug prescriptions and is the one who owns the apartment Ethan was found in. And I have to give full credit to this level. When I was playing Detroit's Become Human, there is a level where when you're playing as Kara that you arrive to a house where someone is supposed to help you. It is the Soviet Union of red flags. It is so obvious that the game even stops to tell you that it's probably a trap. I don't like this place and that man. Let's go, I have a bad feeling. I mean, the creepy guy literally takes you down to the basement. In my personal review on Instagram, I said that I wish a game would just let the player leave the obviously bad situations instead of being forced through them. If I can tell that it's not a great place to be, and more importantly, the characters themselves can also tell it's not a great place to be, then the option to leave should be possible. And it is in this level with Madison. You can sneak through the house, find the information you need, and then just leave. I didn't even know that there was a fight sequence in this level because I just got out as quickly as I could. Like, Madison can die in this level, and I had absolutely no idea because the game just let me leave. And I honestly have to say that it deserves a lot of praise for letting that happen. The information Madison finds here leads to a man named Paco. Hey, thanks for accepting my little invitation. And the best description that I can give of him is this. What is up, player? Welcome to Bellagio. I am Danis, and I make out with lots of women. You go up to women and you just say things to be blunt. No, you have to be crazy. Hello, baby. You are not my friend. <laughs> you are strawberry. Baco is not a character. He is as much of a caricature as Blake is. The first time I heard him speak, I instantly thought of Shane in that moment and could just not take it seriously anymore. Which is unfortunate, 
because this ends up being quite an empowering scene for Madison as she takes what is a terrible situation and turns it on its heel, putting you are not my friend back in his place. Using some, um, let's go with enhanced interrogation techniques, Madison learns the name of the person who rented the apartment. And this ultimately leads her back to a woman named Anne Shepard who is the mother of the origami killer. Now at this point in the game, the player does know that the killer is using his dead brother's identity, which I'm pretty sure would arouse some sort of suspicion. But because of this, the player does have some sort of idea who Ann Shepard is before Madison gets to her. But obviously Madison does not have all of the same information and she needs to find it out on her own. Now in contrast to the doc, I absolutely hated this level. The controls for this origami section were absolutely terrible, making it way too easy to accidentally back out. But more importantly than that, Anne is suffering from Alzheimer's, so she doesn't answer a lot of the questions. I mean, at least that's what the game is claiming is happening. But the thing is that this is actually a really bad representation of Alzheimer's, as it feels like Anne is just more scared of the random woman who showed up and is asking her questions about her dead son than, well, anything else. Ultimately, it becomes a puzzle of using the right stimulus to get the correct response, but the sheer amount of times that Madison goes, His name, Mrs. Shepard. What was his name? Is just infuriating. Like, instead of being dramatic or suspenseful like it's obviously meant to be, I cannot emphasize just how much I hated this particular level. And what makes it worse is that Madison does eventually get the name she is looking for as Anne whispers it into her ear, only to ensure that the player doesn't know the true identity of the killer yet. But in this moment, Madison gets wide-eyed, implying she knows exactly who this man is. Except, she doesn't. But we'll get back to that. Having her information, she runs straight off to the killer's apartment that I guess she just has the address to, and for some reason doesn't tell the police about it, even though she knows that the police are currently after Ethan. There's a whole sequence here, but point being is that she ends up in this hidden room, and I need you to remember that this exists because here she finds where Sean is being kept, escapes the room, and manages to make it to the warehouse. She gets past all of the cops, and oh hey, that's why she couldn't lose her bike, and she manages to save Ethan. Now you know what's really interesting? For everyone that's not in the United States, this is the cover of Heavy Rain. It's even the cover that you see on Steam. It's quite simple showing the origami figures seen throughout the game, and it doesn't really depict much, but there is intrigue in the minimalistic style. Also, I definitely remember seeing this in the US, but for some reason, the only copies of it available are from foreign countries. But in the US, this is the cover that you'll have. And you'll notice that this cover is a little different. While the origami figure is still very present, so are the four main characters. Ethan, who is the main character of the story, is just a face hidden behind Madison for some reason. And the way that this cover is presented makes it seem like Madison is the main character and the focus when that's as far from the truth as it could possibly be. And I'm really curious why this is the case, no pun intended. Because, I mean, I would argue that even this guy is way more important. So let's talk about him. That is one clear-cut case of police brutality. Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events While Growing Up was one of my favorites. A word which here means I reread that series obsessively. Now, there's a lot of story here that's not really relevant, so all that you need to know is that in Book the Sixth, The Ersatz Elevator, the Baudelaire children were trying to stop the evil Count Olaf from smuggling their kidnapped friends, the Quagmires, out of the city. Count Olaf, in disguise, holds an auction containing several large items, including the one that the Quagmire children are in, a quite literal large red herring. 
The Baudelaire children ignore this red herring specifically because of how obvious it is. Norman Jaden is an FBI agent sent to help investigate the origami killer. Tell me if you've heard this one before. He has an experimental device called Ari, which I originally thought stood for Augmented Reality Interface, but apparently stands for Added Reality Interface. I guess the whole concept of augmented just wasn't really a thing like it is now back in 2010. But either way, it's an awesome device and a very useful way of making these investigative scenes way more interesting than what you would usually get in a detective story. Now, the first time we meet Norman is in the fifth chapter of the game, which really just shows how late Madison gets introduced. The first thing we see in this chapter, though, is how much rain has fallen, which at this point is about 0.68 inches. The problem is that the player doesn't learn why this is important yet. It's a very important thing to include in the end, but it's a strange inclusion to have when the context just isn't there yet. Like, imagine if we learned about the Infinity Stones early into Iron Man 1. Like, yes, they're important to the overall story, just not yet. However, the player is also introduced to Norman's drug habit, though it's only shown and not actually taken. And you might as well forget that I ever actually said that because the game basically just does too. Instead, Norman leaves his vehicle to go to the crime scene of the latest victim of the origami killer. He gathers some evidence and unfortunately, meets the pile of garbage known as Blake. The next time we see Norman though, he's back at the local police department settling in. He meets some new colleagues and can contribute to the fund for a nice foreshadowing watch before being shown to his new office, which is unfortunately nothing more than a terrible side closet. However, thanks to Ari, that doesn't really matter because he can transform it into whatever he wants, and well, so can the player but here he can browse through all the evidence. And while I think this was an amazing idea, I don't think it was executed to the full extent that it should have or could have been. I mean, it works relatively all right, but you quickly find out that there's not really that much you can do as it continuously seems to stop just short of what it should be able to do. A word which here means it really doesn't matter if you look at the evidence or not, because none of the information that you find actually leads to anything. Sort of. For instance, you can analyze the origami figure found with that latest victim, and while it gives you the makeup of the figure itself, like the actual paper, it doesn't lead to any fingerprints or clues, ultimately making that feature kind of useless. You can also analyze the figure on the map where you'll discover that there is a single origami store in the entire town. You would be forgiven in thinking this might be a clue or at least a starting place, but no, you can't actually do anything with that information. You can't even go to the store. It is never brought up again ever. It is just a blip on the map. Well, all right, maybe you can analyze other things on the map too. Maybe adding more information will narrow down a potential location for the killer. No. If you analyze the locations of the previous victims, it wipes away the location of the store for some reason. The only time you can cross analyze anything and narrow down a location is at the end of the game when it very specifically wants you to. Throughout the rest of the game, you just can't. And it's a similar it's similar to the beginning interaction with Madison at her apartment. There's a lot of fluff for the player to do, but there's not really anything that happens or anything important. And what's really weird about all of this is that in the manual for Heavy Rain, you'll notice that obviously the origami figure shape is here and it's made up of points on a map. So the game itself is advertising that you can do this, that you can point at all these different locations over town and try to connect them to find the killer. But then when you actually try to do that in the game, it literally does not let you because it's not meant to work that way. In fact, the only thing that all of this evidence does lead to is Norman making a profile of the killer 
even though there's like six other victims at this point and it probably was already done. But here is where we learn that Sean only has about three days to live, despite the fact that actual heavy rain would have killed him in about 20 hours, so maybe Blake does have a reason? But anyway, it's only here that we finally learn the importance of the amount of rain that has fallen. A little late, but we got there. Now, despite having this profile thanks to the evidence presented, Blake will still make several aggressive and just outright derogatory comments throughout. That may be true in novels, but there's a child's life at stake here. And what size is this, uh, zone? Oh, great. There must be 10,000 people live in that sort of area. You gonna question them one by one? Ah, damn it. We're wasting our time with this bullshit. The killer's out there somewhere, and we gotta get off our asses and find him. Tell me, Agent Jaden, did you get your vast experience on the job, or did you just fucking read about it in some school book? Fucking no. asshole! That's enough! And it is excessive, honestly. It is just stupidly excessive how much he digs into Norman here. There's no reason for him to be acting in such a way. He's just... Fucking no. asshole! There's no redeeming factor for Blake, no sad backstory to him. He is just a horrible person that is constantly infuriating. And... While definitely real, it's one of the better examples of how much they didn't really care for good writing in this story, as Blake does not just hate Norman, he almost hates logic, because all of the decisions that he makes throughout this game just do not make sense. Especially when the first suspect that Norman and Blake go to check out is a man who is clearly and obviously mentally ill. When no one answers the door at first, Blake just breaks into the home. Now, Norman voices his discontent about this, but then it's literally never brought up again. Blake faces no repercussions. Absolutely nothing takes place because of this. Because, while the writers loved including important moments, they also like to forget that those moments have effects. Now, inside the apartment, they find zero evidence that the man, Nathaniel, is the origami killer. Despite this, Blake proceeds to interrogate Nathaniel when he shows up shortly thereafter and absolutely pushes the poor man way beyond his limit. What about the voices, Nathaniel? Do you still hear the voices? We know who talks to you, don't we, Nathaniel? Or we both know who talks to you. Don't. Speak that name. What does Blake, he say to you, What are you doing? I can't talk about it. You mustn't talk about it. He orders you to go and find new prey, doesn't he? He needs more and more. No. No. You mustn't mention him. You'll bring him here. He told you to go and find that kid in the park. The voices tormented you all night long. You wanted them to stop, didn't you, Nathaniel? Stop! Stop! That's enough! So you obeyed them to make them stop. You took that boy with you and you drowned him. Isn't that right? Oh. That's enough. Leave no. him alone. Stop! Stop! You killed them, didn't you, Nathaniel? Are you going to confess, you bastard? <laughs> That is one clear-cut case of police brutality. Feeling pressured and scared and clearly incapable of making good, logical decisions, Nathaniel pulls out a gun. Now, depending on how you play this moment, Nathaniel could just end up dead. I... I shot him. Which Blake and Norman should absolutely lose their badges for. Or, in the best case scenario, Nathaniel could end up arrested, with some police brutality involved. So how exactly is Nathaniel the bad one here? How is that the best case scenario for him? But with one suspect off the list, and by the way we don't ever actually learn where this list comes from, Norman and Blake go to investigate the next on the list, Miroslav Gorda. When they approach Miroslav to see if they can just ask him a few questions, he runs away. Blake is, once again, instantly convinced that this is an admission of guilt and Miroslav must then be the killer, and he sends Norman chasing after him. 
Now, I know when I showed this clip earlier, I said it doesn't really matter if you fail QTEs, but there are some moments that it does, and honestly, this is one of them. If you fail a few too many here, Mitoslav would get away. Or really, you just need to hit the last one. Which ultimately doesn't actually matter anyway, but if the player does capture him, you'll learn that he only ran away as he failed to report to his parole officer and actually has several alibis. It's quite literally just a big waste of time, and once again shows the buffoon that Blake is. But hey, that's okay, because Norman and Blake finally go and visit Ethan's psychiatrist after being tipped off by Ethan's ex-wife's one and only appearance beyond the prologue. And the psychiatrist is weirdly confidential about the information here. Like, I know that client confidentiality is a very real thing, but that usually stops once the police get involved. Now because of this, Blake goes full rage mode and police brutality is his way to the information needed, and once again, this is never brought up again and Blake faces no repercussions because of this. Like, sure, Norman can intervene again, but that's not the point. Now while this interaction does 100% confirm for Blake that Ethan is the killer, despite being over two so far, it actually convinces Norman that Ethan must be innocent. Now instead of saying you're doing anything with that or about Blake's behaviors, Norman just goes and plays the piano. I wish I was joking, but I'm not. That is like literally what he does for some reason. Now, the scene is slightly important as he does discover Lee to go off and assuming Ethan doesn't get arrested, Norman can go and investigate it. Now this lead, leads him to a junkyard run by a convict named Mad Jack, and apparently it's entirely possible for Norman to die here. I had no idea, and in fact this level is why I originally thought that you could just miss QTEs because boy did I miss a whole ton of them while playing this level, but it really doesn't matter because you'll, you'll be okay. Mad Jack is thought to have sold a stolen car to the origami killer, and when confronted, He's uncooperative, but that's also because he literally has some dead bodies hiding about 20 feet away. And assuming Norman doesn't die, he will be able to get more information about that stolen car. And this leads him back to... You are not my friend! Okay, yeah, somehow the journalist got here before the FBI agent with all of the resources. And wasn't the car the first clue that Norman had anyway? But it ends up that he's ever so slightly too late because somehow, from the time that Madison left about 30 seconds ago to the time that Norman arrives just moments later, Paco was killed by the origami killer. And that's why we had to have her first and is the only reason Norman had to be second because the killer is actually still present and the two end up fighting. Now there are some more vital QTEs that you have to hit here, but regardless of what you do, the killer will get away. Norman can chase him out of the office, and despite a bodyguard being literally right there, who definitely saw where he went, Norman just decides to give up. Instead of asking or trying or looking, he just goes back inside to investigate the murder scene and gather some evidence, and for some reason also does not call the police. I mean, you would think actually having evidence that it's not Ethan Mars would warrant telling the rest of the police department, but you know, I'm, I'm not a police officer, I don't know. But back at the police department, Norman is looking over all of the evidence he's collected throughout the game in one final effort to find the true identity of the origami killer. Blake, having been convinced of Ethan's guilt, tried to capture Ethan at the motel earlier, but gives up in quite a really dumb moment. So, on your knees, hands behind your head. Easy, pal. Nowhere to go. Surround. I mean, Ethan just jumped off of a roof and was clearly already hurt. There's like 50 cops there, it's not like Ethan's just going to get away, why did you just stop? But, since Ethan did get away, Blake has to find him again, which he does at the warehouse. 
Now, wanting to prevent Blake from killing an innocent man, Norman is now desperate. And this is when you learn the twist. No, sadly, not, not, not that twist, but Norman's twist. See, the real drug wasn't that blue thing that we all completely forgot about. The real drug was Ari. Yeah, if the player spends too much time in it at the end of the game, they will automatically get a worse ending for Norman, which is really stupid because the amount of time spent in Ari throughout the rest of the game is completely irrelevant. You can sit in it for a full hour while at the junkyard and you will be totally fine. But spend more than two minutes at the end of the game and there goes Norman's sanity. And it literally is two minutes. You are expected to understand that the rules of the game have now changed and somehow solve all the clues in under two minutes, including by doing the very things that you probably tried at the beginning of the game and didn't work. And if you don't figure that out, good job. Norman now has a worse ending. However, Norman will find out who the actual killer is once again, thanks to a little help from that foreshadowing watch. The Baudelaire children do not try to bid on the giant red herring because of how obvious it was, instead choosing to bid on something else they believe the Quagmires to be in. They were wrong. The Quagmires were actually being held in the literal large red herring. When Norman is trying to determine the killer's identity at the end of the game, the player is presented with a clear opportunity of accusing Blake. The only reason that he was such a despicable character throughout the entire game was because of this. He was meant to be the red herring and grab your attention throughout so you didn't realize who the actual killer was. The problem being, just like in the ersatz elevator, the obvious answer wasn't incorrect. Blake may not be the origami killer but he absolutely is the villain of this game. Being hostile towards a mentally ill man, potentially leading to his death, continuous brutality against everyone, and the utter willingness to kill a man who is just looking for his own kidnapped son with zero evidence is absolutely psychotic behavior. And I, I don't care if the game calls him out at the end. Blake, you are an unbalanced, psychopathic asshole. I'll take that as a compliment. That does not make it any better. The fact that there were zero repercussions for him for anything that he did is sadly probably the most realistic aspect of this game and I just hate everything about that. Norman does find the actual killer's identity and makes it to the warehouse in time to stop him. Now. Somehow, Blake and the other police officers do not see when Norman and the origami killer fight, which will ultimately lead to the killer dying. We have Ethan getting to the warehouse to save Sean, Madison getting to the warehouse to save Ethan, and Norman getting to the warehouse to confront the killer and stop Blake. But there were four playable characters. So how does Scott Shelby tie into all of this? Scott Shelby was one of the more entertaining characters to play as alongside Ethan and his five trials, where Madison was pretty non-existent for most of the story and Norman had to deal with Blake, Shelby's storyline had a much more unique approach to things and offered just enough diversity to be able to stand on its own. There are no trials, no real time limits, just a guy investigating things in his own way. It was interesting and I always looked forward to whatever came next with him. Shelby is introduced in the fourth chapter of the game when he goes to a pretty sleazy motel, which is not the same motel as the one Ethan is staying at. He's looking for a young woman named Lauren Winter. She is a prostitute. I like hamburgers. Neither of those things matter. Just like Madison's insomnia, this has literally zero effect on the rest of the game and is never brought up again. Like, at all. She could have literally been anything. But way more importantly than that, 
Her son is one of the origami killer's victims. We learn that Shelby is a private investigator and he wants to know about Johnny, who is Lauren's son, and the circumstances of his disappearance. He hopes that this will help provide some sort of clue as to the identity of the killer. After a brief conversation, which doesn't really go well, Lauren asks Shelby to leave. He does and has an asthma attack. Now while that might seem important, this is the only time in the game that this happens and it is only ever brought up at all on one other occasion. And I'll talk more about that in just one second, but it sure seems like a lot of things in this game fit that description. Now as this asthma attack happens, an ex-client of Lauren's barges into the room and starts assaulting her. Shelby can either intervene and stop the ex or simply walk away. It doesn't really matter as either way leads to the same outcome in this case. However, Shelby is a very unfortunate man as later that night he goes to a convenience store wanting to speak to the father of a different origami killer victim. Now here, you can buy more inhalers, ending that plotline entirely. No, seriously, that's it. Literally one chapter after the asthma is brought up, it's done. It's completely irrelevant past this point, despite there being several moments where it would probably come into play. But that's where it stops. But hey, the store happens to get robbed in that exact moment. I don't know, seems like a good time to get asthma as any. And it's entirely possible for the store owner to get killed here, but if he survives, he will give Shelby a shoebox that he found in a locker shortly after his son disappeared. It was apparently left by the origami killer, just like the one that Ethan finds in his storyline, and just like Ethan, it was never taken to the police for some reason. Why does no one take anything to the police in this game? I mean, there was a gun inside of that thing. It had to come from somewhere, right? Now, the next morning, Shelby goes to visit a third victim's parents. This time, no one answers the door and he can hear a crying baby inside. This reminded me very much of a moment from Detroit Become Human. Now, he breaks in and finds the mother had just tried to kill herself. Though he manages to save her, and I need you to remember that, he does not take her to the hospital or call an ambulance or really do anything. I mean, he does help take care of the baby, but that's it. This interaction eventually leads to Shelby learning that the father actually disappeared shortly after their son did, and Shelby is told that he had a mysterious phone. Once again, just like the one that Ethan finds in his box. Shelby then takes the phone and leaves. Yet yeah, this is one of those chapters that wasn't really long, but was still much longer than it actually needed to be. Later that night, back at his office, Shelby is visited by Lauren. She has a letter sent to her by the origami killer and offers to give it to him if and only if he lets her be his partner in the investigation. Now, even though he does not want to at first, he eventually agrees. And I need you to remember that too. Especially because unlike a later point in the game, this is a decision that is forced upon you. You do not have a choice here. Lauren will join the team. Working together now, the two then immediately go and visit a rich boy named Gordy Kramer. He's throwing a party at his mansion and after some shenanigans, Shelby manages to find Gordy and confronts him. Apparently, Gordy has been involved in some weird and suspicious activity, and Shelby believes he might be the origami killer. However, when confronted, Gordy refuses to cooperate and gives them no clear answers. Very well. I'm the origami killer. I get my victims into my car, I drown them in rainwater, then I dump them on a wasteland with an origami figure in one hand and an orchid on their chest. I do that because I'm bored, Mr. Shelby, and it's a creative and entertaining way of having fun. Is that good enough for you? Or do you want more? 
The next morning, Shelby is invited to meet with Gordy's father, Charles, who basically just tells him to stop investigating his son and stay away. Rich people do rich people things, I guess. And with that, the focus of the investigation switches from a plot that really kind of came out of nowhere, even though it wasn't bad, to a plot that actually makes way more sense with the characters involved. Seriously, why Gordy was chosen as a suspect is never properly explained. We get the reasons why he is suspicious, but how those suspicions made their way back to Shelby and why he makes that connection to Gordy potentially being the origami killer is never explained at all. So instead, Shelby and Lauren go to try and find answers about the letter that she got from the killer. You know, the whole reason Lauren is part of this story at all? Shelby somehow recognizes that it was written on a typewriter, which is actually a pretty big clue. So they go and visit an old friend of his, Manfred. Now this guy runs an antique repair shop, and when he is presented with the letter, he is not only able to confirm that it was written on a typewriter, but also can tell the exact kind of typewriter it came from. Now, unfortunately, it appears to be a pretty common typewriter, even though the story takes place in 2011. But fortunately, Manfred has written records of everyone who has ever purchased one of them from his store. So, he goes to the back to try and find this record to give it to Shelby. But despite saying that it would only take two minutes, the and the only doors in the store being the front door and the one in the bathroom... Manfred is mysteriously murdered by the origami killer who seemingly escaped out of the back window. Convenient timing, right? Manfred seems to have managed to just barely call the police before dying though, so not wanting to be framed, Shelby says that they must wipe their, his and Lauren's, fingerprints off of everything that they have touched. Okay, on a side note here, when I played this game, I did not wipe down the bathroom door, mainly because the prompt to clean it and the prompt to wipe it down were quite literally the same thing, and I did not want to go in this, you know, back and forth of going in and out of the bathroom for something that I didn't really think would matter. Now, this ultimately did backfire, though, sort of. I mean, I mean, not really, but, like, why did it matter at all? It's a bathroom door, that doesn't really mean anything. A lot of people probably went in and out. And I had like a whole scene where Shelby was talking to the police, but am I really to believe that there was no one else in that store at all? That there was literally no other fingerprints at all? That it was literally just that one that I forgot to remove? And Shelby even says that he was there at that time, even though he could have said that he was there the day before. Like, he didn't need to actually be honest here. But obviously... Like, I mean, obviously there weren't any cameras present. Like, it's a really weird moment and a really weird scene. But if you just get all the fingerprints, then Shelby and Lauren escape no problem. It's, it's fine. Back at Shelby's office slash apartment once more, they discuss Manfred's murder. And Shelby says he thinks it could be Gordy because... Gordy has the time and the means... Not to mention the fucked up attitude to go along with it. Now, they talk more, Shelby revealing he's been working on the case for years, and Lauren learns that he has also been investigating subscribers to origami magazines for some reason. Here, Lauren realizes they can cross-examine the names to those she got from Manfred's. I need you to remember that. That is the biggest thing that I need you to remember. Because doing so... They find a single name on both lists, John Shepard. Unfortunately, John Shepard is dead and has been since he was only 10 years old. They go to the grave for some reason, like, no, really, why do they do that? And find an origami figure there for some reason. And here they also learn the story of young John thanks to a nearby gravedigger who just happens to know the story for some reason. Are you catching on here? 
The Gravedigger shares that young John was playing with his twin brother in a construction yard. They had just been thrown out of their trailer by their drunk father, which is apparently a pretty common occurrence. Though it's raining, the two boys really don't seem to mind, as they're just happy to be with each other. They climb around the construction site, race each other, play some games, and though John always seems to have the lead. Eventually, John even suggests playing hide and seek, asking his brother to count first. On another quick side note here, you can skip some numbers while counting instead of, you know, counting individually, one, two, three, four, etc. And while I personally interpreted this as nothing more than a way of speeding up this section so you don't have to count to like 30 or whatever it was, apparently it's meant to show that the brother is cheating. But anyway, when he finishes counting, something's wrong. John is crying out for help, and a quick search finds him stuck in a large broken pipe quickly filling with rainwater. His foot is somehow stuck and he can't get it out. Though Shelby and Lauren don't learn it here, the player later learns that John's brother rushes back to their father begging for help. Go away! Please, Dad, I'm begging you! John's gonna die! John's gonna die! Or, um, I mean, super totally seriously asking for help? Like... I don't think a sober father would have taken that seriously, but either way, he doesn't care. The brother rushes back to John, holding onto him as he dies, thus creating the Origami Killer. Now, after the Gravedigger finishes his part of the story, Lauren makes the connection that the brother likely is the Origami Killer. The Gravedigger tells them that the brother was taken from the parents shortly thereafter and given a brand new name. It's not much, but at least it's a lead. Now, while Shelby and Lauren go to leave the cemetery, suddenly Charles Kramer is there visiting John Shepard's grave. This moment is nothing more than another red herring. It does come back, but the explanation is stupid. The explanation is that Charles owned the construction site where John died. That's it. The day that they're visiting isn't even like the anniversary or anything, it's just completely random. But the player is meant to believe that Gordy is the mysterious brother. But when you learn who the real killer is, this and the following scene make absolutely no sense. Like, in a realistic world, like the one that they were going for, the following scene would just not happen. Because sometime later that night, Shelby returns home to find that his front door is unlocked. He walks in and finds Lauren, who apologizes because guess who? Kramer is there saying that they should have dropped the investigation on his son. Which is weird, because that's exactly what they did. I mean, even though they privately still believed Gordy was the killer, ever since Shelby and Mr. Kramer talked back at the golf course, Gordy was left completely alone. Also, it's been like one day. I mean, we can assume that Charles probably saw them at the graveyard, but that literally does not mean anything, and it doesn't mean that they were investigating the son, because they weren't. And he would know that. Charles would know that, since Charles knows that Gordy isn't the mysterious brother. There is literally no reason other than to fool the player for this interaction. See... Kramer is so mad that he knocks out Shelby and Lauren, and Shelby wakes up in a sinking car. Now, apparently Lauren can die here, but act fast enough, and Shelby can not only save himself, but can in fact also save Lauren. Something else I need you to remember. Pissed off at this, Shelby bursts into Kramer's mansion and goes on an absolute rampage. I mean, he kills a lot of bodyguards just to get to Kramer. This dude had like a small nation's worth of bodyguards, and it's still not enough. Now, Shelby does make it to Kramer, though, and in an effort to save his own life, Kramer spills everything he knows about Gordy, proving that he is actually innocent, and also spills everything that he knows about John Shepard and Shepard's mysterious brother. Keep in mind, Lauren is not present for this. Conveniently though, Kramer can have a heart attack and die. Now, there are two reasons that this heart attack happens. First, bad writing. Second, because Shelby cannot get arrested. Because of the overall storyline and things needing to happen, 
Shelby cannot get arrested. It is not a possibility in this world. And that's a really hard thing to make happen when he literally just killed like 20 people. I mean, realistically, had Kramer survived, Shelby probably would have either been arrested or straight up killed in retaliation, but even with Kramer dead, it probably would have happened anyway. This is one of the richest and most influential men in the area. He absolutely had cameras. I mean, it's 2011, not the Stone Age. Someone would have noticed and found the dead bodies, and Shelby doesn't clean up his fingerprints here. Like, sure, he doesn't directly kill Kramer, but again, all those bodyguards still count. But none of that matters, because the writer said that Kramer had to be out of the picture, so they made it so. I just want to mention this one more time, because I want to be very clear about the sequence of events that just happened. Shelby confronts Gordy. Charles, Gordy's dad, tells Shelby to leave his son alone. Shelby and Lauren do exactly that, completely refocusing their investigation on the letter. They spend time doing that, find a lead, and go to the graveyard. Charles, in pure chance, happens to also go to the graveyard that day and sees Shelby and Lauren despite Gordy being left alone, and despite being fully aware that Gordy is not John Shepard's brother, for some reason, Kramer takes this to mean that Shelby and Lauren are still investigating Gordy and tries to drown them. If that doesn't show you that the writing problems this story has, well, there's more, because this is the very last time we actually play as Shelby. Okay, there is one more sequence that occurs, but to discuss that, we have to talk about something. Yup, it's finally time. We're finally here. It's time to talk about... What a twist! The four chapters leading up to the reveal all show the different characters figuring out this information on their own. Madison learns the name by talking to Anne Shepard. Ethan never actually figures it out, only the address to go to, and then gets confronted there. Norman then figures it out in his RE deep dive, and finally, the player is told who the killer is, because this is when the rest of John Shepard's story is actually told, once again, through another flashback. This is when the dad refuses to help, and the brother returns to John. And right before he dies, John says, Don't forget about this Scotty. Wait, who the hell is Scotty? That guy? But that doesn't even make any sense. No, seriously, the first time that I played this game, I had no idea who Scotty was, in part because Scott Shelby is usually only ever referred to as Shelby. You probably forgot that his first name was Scott, since I only ever called him Shelby too. But this is the absolute smallest part of all of this. There are so many other reasons that this twist does not work. The final time that you play as Scott, he is in his apartment burning slash destroying all of the evidence that he has collected so far. Which immediately brings into question, that if he wanted it all destroyed, why did he send it out in the first place? These are items he willingly sent or gave to people. Things like Lauren's letter didn't need to be sent. I mean, they end up not really having much of a purpose anyway. Well, I guess it leads to the box, but a simple paper saying, go here probably could have done the same and been a lot less suspicious or, well, evidency. Also, why did he even tell her that it was written on a typewriter, especially if he was worried that it would get back to him? That's just stupid to do, there's no reason for him to bring that up to her. But anyway, instead of any of that, he's destroying all of this evidence and it's revealed that he was never actually helping these families or investigating the killer at all. This whole time, he was only trying to destroy any evidence that could lead back to him. Except that he absolutely did help all of those families and was investigating the killer. 
Okay, so I'll start with the smaller gripes, but you'll quickly see why the more one thinks about the twist, the more it starts to unravel. Cause settle in because there's a bit here. Remember that part where Scott almost drowns? So he drives to the Kramer mansion and goes on a rampage killing everyone and then leaving Charles Kramer to die from his heart attack? After Kramer spills the beans of Scott to Scott? So that shows that he has no problem killing outright. I mean, yes, he's a serial killer, but so far he's only been so messed up to target kids. But in that chapter, we learn that Scott will just outright kill. So why isn't that the case throughout the rest of the game? When he finds that mother who had tried to kill herself, why did he go through the effort of saving her? Think about it. Why did he save her? Oh, it's so he could get the phone. But why? You have to remember that he didn't just save her, he went in and legitimately helped in several other ways. Besides, he didn't even know that the phone was there or that there was any evidence there. From the perspective of him being a serial killer trying to make sure nothing can get traced back to him, that's one less problem to solve. Oh, it's so the players can like him and think he's trustworthy. Yeah, but then the game is just outright lying to you and going against who this character is. Like, I don't mean it lies to you by making you think that Scott is trying to help when he's really trying to destroy the evidence. That part is fine. What I mean is that Scott in this scene is not Scott the Origami Killer. This is a cold-blooded child killer. He is shown to have no empathy for others, even being willing to burn Madison alive. So why does he suddenly care about this woman? Oh, it's because he only cares about the fathers. He literally kills his mother and tries to kill Madison. So no, no he doesn't. And if the mother were to have died and the police eventually go to the house, even if they find the phone, it won't matter. There is nothing directly linking it to Scott. They even say the phone is dead. So obviously Scott doesn't know that there's anything else there, but he'd have plenty of time to look around anyway. I mean, Look, he's a serial killer, it's not like he has morals. But also, I just realized something. This woman's husband is said to have gone missing, and you can actually see him during the second trial. No one investigated that? No one found that remotely suspicious? The convenience store clerk can be killed in the confrontation. But why would Scott even get involved in the first place? Okay, sure, it might be so he can get the evidence, and I, I know, but from the perspective of what he is actually trying to do, why would he get involved? Even if the guy gets killed and Scott never finds the box, the police probably wouldn't care about it either, especially not with Blake in charge. I mean, there are multiple, multiple victims out there, and this is the only box that Scott retrieves, so clearly it's not enough to get traced back to him, even with all the complaints about characters not taking them to the police. But why, why in the world would Scott let Lauren be his partner? Just why? Again, this is a decision made by the game. The player has no input here. If he is trying to clear his name, even if it's under false pretenses of it by investigating the killer, why would he bring in someone who could very easily derail all of that? And technically did. Clearly, she's not in a situation to be able to investigate things even on her own, or really to be much help at all. There's a scene where Lorne gets fed up and leaves Scott. And for some reason, he goes after her. Like, okay, sure, you don't actually have to, but most players will. But in universe, he had an out. He had the ability to just get rid of her, but he brought her back for some reason. And what's even worse is then when they are drowning in the car, why does he save her? So obviously, this is because the player does not realize that they are actually playing as the serial killer throughout these moments. But that is the exact problem. That is why this twist does not work. Because the Scott that we play as and the Scott we do not play as are two completely different 
people. Because the player cannot intentionally make the actions or decisions that Scott Shelby would. Yes, Lauren can die underwater. Something Scott Shelby would absolutely let happen to solve a problem that he did not need to be in in the first place. But the player will likely try to save her because it's the right thing to do and leads to a better ending. So the two sides conflict, leaving behind nothing but a giant mess. Just like the whole Gordy investigation. We never actually learn where most of this comes from, and I'm guessing that's because it doesn't actually matter or have much of a leg to stand on. One might be able to say it's to throw Lauren off and make it seem like Scott is actually investigating things, but the game never says as much. And you have to remember, she wasn't there when Scott confronts either Gordy at first or Charles after the shootout. Now, one could also say he's trying to pin the blame on someone else so he could get off scot-free, pun very intended this time, but the game never says that either. Now, we do get reasons why Gordy is suspicious, but it's nothing the police would really agree with, especially when you consider that the police weren't even bothering with him. However, one of the biggest issues with the reveal is that the player does play as Scott during times when he is meant to be doing origami killer things. For instance, the second trial that Ethan undertakes, you know, the glass crawling and pylon maze one, starts at 7.42pm. Lauren shows up to Scott's apartment at about 730 She's there for several minutes, and then the two go off to Kramer's party. So Scott definitely could not have watched Ethan or been there. So first, who closed the door behind Ethan? And second, Scott would not have known if Ethan had looked around and found another way in. For the third trial, there is a tiny bit of room here. Scott meets with Kramer at 7 a.m., and the third trial doesn't begin until 7.47. The conversation between Scott and Kramer wasn't that long, and he may have gotten home with plenty of time. Same with the fifth trial, where Scott had more than plenty of time to get home. In fact, the game is actually pretty clever at making sure that Scott is not busy during trials where cameras are involved, like the third and fifth. And while that's fine, it does bring into question of how did he know when Ethan would do them? Sure, Scott absolutely had plenty of time to get home and watch Ethan cut off a finger, but how did he know when Ethan would do it? How did he know Ethan would go and drink the poison when he did? We know, because we saw it when Lauren shows up between the first and second trials, that he doesn't always hang out in that hidden room. But for the third and fifth, it's not like Scott was able to just watch a playback later because Ethan is only given the information as soon as the trial is complete. In fact, same for the first trial actually, meaning Scott had to be watching. It only works if Scott somehow knows when Ethan is going to go do those things. But what if Lauren is bothering him while Ethan does trial number three? What happens then? Does Ethan just not get the information? It's pure chance that Ethan chose to go to the apartment so early in the morning. Now, even if you have an explanation for the trials, which you very well may have, there is one scene in which there is no argument, no explanation, that will work. And if you know anything about this game, you know we've been getting to this moment. When did Scott kill Manfred? That was one of the stupidest things that I've ever seen. This is the absolute dumbest moment in the entire game. You are not going to change my mind, and I don't feel like you're going to even want. Not because I'm stubborn, I mean, I am. But because the only explanation for what happens here is magic. I was actually on board with the twist until the flashback reminded me of this moment.
Why? Because you literally play as Scott the entire time. Here is what happens starting the moment that Manfred leaves to get the records. There is one semi cutscene focusing entirely on Lauren, but Scott is shown to not move during it. You can then immediately go to the back where Scott is visibly shocked at finding Manfred dead. Unless you want me to believe that Scott slipped to the back during that cutscene and then came back to the exact same spot completely unnoticed, when did he kill Manfred? There's no cut, there's no cut scene until after you find him dead, and speaking of which, why does Scott act shocked? Why is he reacting to a camera that doesn't actually exist for him? It's literally just to try and fool the audience. And you can't say he was trying to fool Lauren because she wasn't even in the room. So yes, you are absolutely supposed to believe that in the 12 seconds Lauren was looking at the music box, Scott slipped to the back killed Manfred, opened the window, called the police, then came back out and stood in the same exact spot without being noticed or heard and without having an asthma attack. All despite the fact that when this is shown again in the flashback, it takes twice as long to get through. Simply put, that just did not happen. Just because the camera is entirely focused on Lauren and the box, doesn't magically mean that the rest of the world just disappears. We're not babies anymore, we understand object permanence. I mean, at this very moment of filming, I'm not able to see my cat, but I know it still exists. Even if Lauren was focused entirely on the box, she has peripheral vision. So though she may not have consciously noticed Scott sipping away, she still would have noticed to some degree. Not to mention heard it, even with all the clocks. But look, we're not done with this scene yet. Because you know how the player even learns that there's something wrong and they should go and check on Manfred? Manfred says that he will only be about two minutes. And you can theoretically wait around for quite a while. But once you eventually get bored and decide to check Scott's thoughts, told you we'd get back to this, Scott says, It's been a while since Manfred went into his office. Hello? Manfred! Now, before the twist is revealed, that is a completely reasonable thought to have. Because, yeah, it makes sense. Where is Manfred? But after, why, if Scott had just killed Manfred, would he privately be thinking this? He didn't say it out loud. He thought it to himself. So once again, it's because the game is being disingenuous to you. Realistically, he would probably be thinking something along the lines of, Oh god, why did I do that? Why did I call the police? I need to get out of here. But the game cannot be honest with you in this moment. Otherwise, it would spoil the reveal too soon. But it ends up sacrificing believability and authenticity because of that. Because I played as Scott during a moment when he apparently did something else, I can no longer believe that anything Scott did is what actually happened. And I mean that in a bad way. Because the thoughts Scott had were not genuine or believable, I can no longer trust any of the beliefs he or any character has. The gotcha of the twist does not work because it's not earned. 
the game was never cleverly hiding the fact that you were playing as the killer all along because you weren't. Sure, you do play as Scott Shelby for portions of the game, but the actions taken as him are not that of the origami killer. Those just happen, even when you're in control, and the player is wrongfully made to choose actions that a serial killer like Shelby would never make. I mean, this is a man who kidnaps children and slowly kills them over the course of several days. This is not a man of morality. This is a psychotic monster. Do you think he would care if the baby lives? Do you think he would save the woman who was unknowingly causing him problems? Do you think he would care about any of this? And you want to know what's even worse about all of this? The ultimate gut punch to this scene? The whole reason that Scott kills Manfred is to get the clientele list and destroy it. He does not want Lauren or the police finding it, or anyone else for that matter. Even though it doesn't have his name on it, I mean, it would say John Shepard, which it does, and as we see, it is enough to link back to him. Now, this had Scott worried enough that he killed a man with Lauren standing 10 feet away, and we literally see him take the list. But somehow, in the very next chapter with Scott and Lauren, somehow Lauren has that list instead. What's that? The notebook I took from Manfred's place. It's never explained. It's never talked about. It just is. She just somehow has the list that we see Scott remove. And despite once again never seeing her actually do this during the level. So not only did the writers create an impossible scene where Shelby kills Manfred, opens the window, calls the police, and finds the records in just 12 seconds, but then it ends up being completely pointless anyway as Lauren just has the list. It's like they completely forgot what they just wrote. There was quite literally no point to the scene. The end result is exactly the same. Just like with Jason dying at the beginning of the game, it was clear that they knew what the end result would be, but didn't really think about how things would get there. So let me tell you a secret. That's the trick to writing. It's easy to know where you want the story to go. Getting there and doing it right is the hard part. Or you can be like the writer of Heavy Rain and just completely ignore logical progression and just make whatever you want happen whenever you want it to happen. Because who cares about it making sense when you can just lie to your audience instead? We're still not done. Earlier, I talked about three elements which help make a twist memorable and great. As a recap, as it has been a little bit, the three components are the external, internal, and philosophical shifts. The external is where elements of the plot are rearranged. The internal is how the reveal affects the emotion of the character or characters. And the philosophical is a change in how the audience perceives the theme. Now the external shift is the easiest of the three to see in Heavy Rain, because the entire time, the person we are looking for is right in front of our very eyes. More specifically, instead of playing as Scott Shelby to help victims, we were instead playing as Scott to use them to gather evidence so he could destroy it all. Now while one could argue that this does directly relate to there being a philosophical shift, I must question that. The reveal is Scott's identity. But in order for there to be a philosophical shift, the theme of the story must change, or more so how one perceives it. And I must ask then, what is the theme of Heavy Rain? There are some things which just have to happen, even if you don't want them to. Sometimes things happen even when you don't want them to. That is a huge part of everyone's story in Heavy Rain. Ethan has blackouts, sees Sean get kidnapped, Jason dies, and overall, he has to go through a lot of bad stuff. 
Madison, has insomnia and must deal with the trauma, has issues with Paco and the Doc, Norman has to deal with Blake the entire time, and even Scott has to face this dilemma in his own weird way. He doesn't want to work with Lauren, but he has to. And there's also the, you know, whole nearly drowning and how the ending doesn't exactly go how he wants to and all of that. However, once Scott is revealed as the killer, it doesn't change the theme, but reinforces it. Realizing you've been helping the bad guy all along only proves that sometimes things happen, even when you don't want them to. I didn't want to be helping the bad guy the whole time, but it happened. So while the elements of the story are recontextualized in a dramatic way, the meaning and theme behind them all still stay exactly the same. So what about the characters, though? How did the twist affect them and their emotions? Well, to be quite honest, it doesn't. Ethan goes through the entire game with absolutely no idea who the killer is, and even when Scott confronts him at the end, he still doesn't know him. More than one might think, he also doesn't care, he just wanted Sean back. Norman never interacts with Scott throughout the entire game up until the very end. The name is never brought up or anything, and when Norman finds out who the killer is, there isn't really a change for him, instead just confirming what he already knew. Ethan was, in fact, innocent. Madison, though, for some reason, is given the most interested response to the reveal. When she visits Anne Shepard and finally gets the answer she was asking for, she acts quite surprised at the name. And, in fact, she's the only character to do so. Except she doesn't have any idea who Scott is. I mean, and it's not like Scott is a unique enough name for her to make the connection, unless we're supposed to assume that Anne shared the new name, which, I mean, probably, but also doesn't really mean anything. Because point being, we don't ever see them interact in any way until they meet at the apartment. And that doesn't come until after the reveal either. That's like if you told me that the Zodiac Killer was Tom Baskins. I mean, cool. I have absolutely no idea who that is, though, but alright. There's no reason to act surprised by that information because it doesn't mean anything to me. So even though Madison reacts in a way as if she knew Scott, she doesn't. And like so many other parts of the game, the reaction just doesn't make sense. Because even if Anne gave her the full name, which isn't impossible, I just don't see why she would, it's not a name Madison knew. Perhaps it's in the cut aspects of the game and maybe we would have seen them interact, but in the game that we did get, they are total and complete strangers. For Scott, I can't really say how the reveal worked, because to him there was no reveal, even though for some reason his demeanor and actions just change completely after we find out it's him. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time he acted like there was a camera there when there wasn't. In fact, the only character to have any sort of emotional change in this story, the only character for whom the reveal is actually a reveal, isn't even a playable one. Lauren is the only person with a distinct change, because she goes from thinking that she's been helping a good man to realizing she's been helping the man who murdered her child. And I actually think that game, the one focused entirely around playing from Lauren's perspective, would let this reveal work so much better. So overall, there's only an external shift involved which is kind of the bare minimum needed for a twist. And while looking back at earlier parts of this game, you might pick up a thing or two hinting at Shelby's true identity, but it's not really a common occurrence and usually just leaves you with more questions anyway. Like, if he's trying not to get caught, why does he leave his list of magazine subscribers just out and about? 
especially knowing that the fake name is included on them. Why does he even have a list to begin with? So sure, Scott tries to divert Lauren's attention away from it, but it's literally only there for plot purposes and there's no reason to actually have it. In the end, there isn't a single aspect of this twist that works. There are several elements of this story that I couldn't really talk about before the reveal without spoiling it, but absolutely need to bring up now. First, there is one element of Heavy Rain which I have never seen anyone talk about. It's a very important aspect to the story, which as soon as I realized what was happening, not only changed everything, but it also ruined the story even more. Now, this all comes from a very minor detail that I think a lot of people miss, but if you look closely, you might notice that Scott Shelby is actually blind. Allow me to explain. I've been looking for a long, long time. Looking for a father that would be able to do what mine could not do. Sacrifice himself in order to save his son. Okay, side note. Does he think a grown man would not have been able to pull John out of the rainwater? Is he under the impression that his dad would have had to die here? Anyway, at the end of the story, it is revealed that Scott chose Ethan because of what happened with Jason. See, Scott just happened to be there that day. Not the first coincidence in this story. He just happened to be standing outside the mall and happened to see Jason get hit by the car even though we didn't see him the first time around. Which means, though, that he should have seen Ethan jump in front of the car to save Jason, or at the very least, noticed Ethan lying between Jason and the car and could have figured out what took place. Or maybe one of the many witnesses said how Ethan jumped in front of the car. Point being is that regardless of how he figured it out, Scott 100% should have known what Ethan did. I've been looking long time looking for a father that would be able to do what mine could not do sacrifice himself in order to save his son sacrifice himself in order to save his son Sacrifice himself in order to save his son. Sacrifice himself. Sacrifice himself. Ahem. He already did! Ethan literally jumped in front of a moving car. Ethan was literally ready to sacrifice himself to save Jason. How much further can a father go than be willing to die? How much more sacrifice can he give than that? I mean, sure, he technically failed the first time, but it wasn't his fault. It wasn't because of anything he did. Realistically, if the impact was enough to kill Jason, then Ethan would have died too. I mean, yeah, he was in a six month coma, but when he took the brunt of the impact, when he dove between Jason and the car, he should have died too. He only failed because the game said he had to. I remember you. Sacrifice himself in order to save his son. It makes zero sense at all for a killer who is specifically trying to see how far a father is willing to go. For a killer who is intentionally trying to find a father who is willing to die for their son to pick Ethan. Especially when he was actually there and saw what happened. I mean, it would have made much more sense for Scott to have not been there and just learned about it because having been there and still choosing Ethan is just absolutely flabbergasting. There is no train of logic in that decision. I mean, I get we're talking about a serial killer, but Scott is still shown to be a somewhat intelligent person he wouldn't have picked Ethan. Now, outside of the game world, in our world, 
This decision was an intentional choice by the writer. The entire story is basically based around the unseen dynamic between these two characters, Scott testing Ethan. Yet, it's the dumbest aspect of the whole story. It's just stupid writing. And how does a writer not even realize this? How do they not realize that the main character wouldn't be chosen because of the actions they had him do? What's so dumb about it is that it's an easy fix. Remember the change I said that I would do? You know where Ethan doesn't jump? Yeah, there was a reason for that and it was this. Because if Ethan didn't jump to save Jason, he'd be living with that guilt. And if Scott saw that, then it would make sense to choose Ethan. And Ethan would have no desire to go to the police with the box because he wants to prove to himself that he can do whatever it takes to save his son. And then there would be more of an emotional impact for the player as Ethan would go from a father that did nothing and let his son die to a father who did everything and saved his son. Because right now, as the story stands, Ethan goes from being a father willing to die for his son to a father willing to die for his son. Do you see the problem? How the hell does this game have such high reviews? How does it have such great ratings? Like, sure, the first 90-ish percent of the story is pretty good, but that last 10% isn't just bad, it's abysmal. It genuinely is some of the absolute worst writing I have ever seen, not because of bad dialogue or plot holes, but because the progression of logic in any aspect of the story is absolutely non-existent. Because the very action the main character takes, which causes him to later be chosen by the killer, was in itself the very action the killer was looking for all along. Because huge chunks of this story don't make any sense when you put any thought into it. Because the game had to straight up lie to you. It had to be disingenuous with its intent multiple times to hide the true nature of Scott ultimately leading to players making choices that Scott wouldn't, like saving Lauren, and being punished with a much worse ending if they don't. Okay, so that's like the big problem with this story and some of the medium-sized ones, but there's also a lot of smaller things, some of which I touched upon, that I really just couldn't fit into individual sections or their appropriate storylines without completely derailing everything. I said I'm just going to stick them all here because if I haven't convinced you that this story is abysmal, well, we're not done yet. To start with, how does the story of John Shepard even get out? Like, I know that this is a game, but in-universe, the groundskeeper tells the whole story, starting from getting kicked out. This includes the games that the boys played and whatnot as well. At least, the game is heavily implying as much since the groundskeeper starts the story and then we immediately cut to the flashback that we play through. And while in the real world the story would probably have been nothing more than poor kid got stuck in a pipe and died, that's not what happens in the game. So, this means that young Scott must have shared this story as we saw it. I mean, he's the only one who could have. And somehow, the groundskeeper not only heard the entire thing, but just remembers all of it too. Which, again, while not impossible, is very weird. Also, somehow he wasn't a suspect. But remember the part that comes right after this, where Charles attacks Shelby and Lauren? The only reason that happens, despite making no sense, is because otherwise, Lauren would have figured out Scott's real identity. And I'm guessing the writers didn't have a good way of handling that. I mean, since they already pulled the Ann Shepard card with Madison, almost like Lauren's inclusion from the beginning makes no sense. But instead of trying to find out some sort of reasonable way to handle this, we instead get a moment that does not fit in with the story that we've seen so far and just comes out of nowhere. But as I was writing all of this, I realized something. John's death is known, at least to some degree. It's known enough for the story to be remembered by the groundskeeper, and it's important enough for Charles, one of the richest guys in the community, to go out of his way on a random day to pay respects. 
So that probably means that the police are well aware of it too, right? And if the police are aware of this kid who died in rainwater and had a brother who was not raised in a stable environment in any way, and then suddenly years later a bunch of kids start dying by being drowned in rainwater, there's a pretty clear connection there. Like, sure, the first one may have been a coincidence, but as soon as there was a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, well, Scott would probably be the number one suspect. And if the police were to have gone to the gravestone of John, they would find that origami killer. Like, how did no one make that connection? Like Ethan and Madison, Scott did have some things left on the cutting room floor. The biggest being the fate of his mother. In the game as it is, players see her dead at the end. That is an objective fact of what happens. The setting kind of implies that Scott is the one who did it, I mean, considering that he's ominously standing there and all, and also because Scott was the one who did it. In the original version of the game, Shelby entered Anne Shepard's hospital room just after Madison. He hugged her in his arms and then smothered her with a pillow. Now that was originally included as part of the game, and yet it was removed because the creators didn't think it made sense for Scott Shelby to kill his own mother. We decided to exclude this very violent scene. A man who venerates the concept of the father to such a degree, and by extension, the concept of the family, cannot kill his mother like that. Which on one hand, this is a guy who venerates the concept of the father, so I can see where they are coming from, but on the other hand... <laughs> He was literally cleaning up all of the evidence he could, and his mom was a pretty big piece of that. It literally led to him being found out after all, and it's not like he's opposed to killing women. I mean... So this whole scene is just really weird. When Madison visits Anne earlier in the game, it's stated that no one has ever visited her, including Scott. He never went to go see her, so why would he now? He wasn't expecting to die, so why, after all of this time, would he choose to go and see her, if not to tie up one more loose end? But then keeping the scene with him there and her clearly not alive still shows exactly what they didn't want to show. There's not really a reason to remove the scene because you don't think the actions undertaken are in line with the character, only for the same to happen in the end result anyway. I personally like how the game is now and that it wasn't included. But if the goal of removing the scene was to not have Scott kill his mother, that just didn't happen. Also, what's with all the orchids? So apparently after killing the kids, Scott would leave an orchid on their chest alongside with the origami figure. But the orchids aren't ever talked about or discussed or like even remotely important. There's that scene with Anne Shepard when they get brought up, but that's it. It feels like a shoehorned in reason for Ari to exist, especially when it takes away from the whole origami aspect of the origami killer because it introduces a much more prevalent and well-known calling card. I mean, yeah, the origami figures are weird, but the orchids are also very deliberate. Also, also, remember how at the beginning of the game it's revealed that Scott has asthma and then it's immediately dropped and never brought up again? 
despite the fact that he performs an impossible task in under 12 seconds and then breathes totally fine, quite literally almost drowns and has no problem breathing, goes through an intense shootout and has zero respiratory issues, fights with Norman at Paco's office and then again at the warehouse, and at no point in any of it does the asthma come into play. If nothing else in this video has convinced you that the writing in this game is terrible, that should. A good writer does not bring up elements for no reason. A good writer does not bring up something so important and then immediately forget about it. I mean, it's the whole concept of Chekhov's gun, because this tells me more than anything that a good amount of this story was just made up as they went along. I wouldn't be surprised if they just wanted to give Scott a quirk like each of the other characters. You know, Ethan with his blackouts, Madison with her insomnia, and Norman with Ari. But then again, the blackouts get dropped immediately, Madison's insomnia is completely irrelevant, and Ari is scarcely used. It's important for characters to have flaws, yes, but those flaws need to actually matter and be brought up. They need to be present in the story, but they're not because the objective here was never to write a good story. Breaking up the different plot lines really helps conceal all of the holes and problems that exist in this narrative. When the last time you play as a character was four levels ago, you're probably not thinking about the inconsistencies that just arose. You probably don't realize that certain things aren't making sense, and that's the point because if you don't realize it, then there isn't really a problem. But if you do, well, then you spend like five months of your life writing a nearly three hour long video that'll probably get like 10 views. I mean, this is an 11 year old game at this point. But look, in my opinion, you cannot go back to play this game to find the clues that you missed or intentionally play Scott knowing that he is the killer because those puzzle pieces don't even exist in the first place. And even if you played every decision from Scott like a killer would, there are plenty of elements that the game completely controls where Scott doesn't act like Scott. You cannot turn away Lauren. You have to investigate Gordy. You have to save the woman and her baby. You have to sit and listen to John's death as if Scott wasn't the one who was there. And none of it works. None of it is able to hold up after the reveal or after further scrutiny. And I hate it. I hate writing like this. I hate writing that thinks it is oh so clever and pulled the rug out from under you when all it did was blindfold you and laugh that you couldn't see. I hope now you can see just how much is wrong with this story. I hope you can see why the twist of Heavy Rain is not one that should be praised. And look, if you enjoyed this game, if you enjoyed the story, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm personally glad that they made this game as it led to two better ones. I mean, Beyond Two Souls still has some serious writing issues, least of which is the fact that the Jody Iden relationship is incestuous, but that's a video for a different time. I mean, I still like the game. And I finished Detroit Become Human in one straight sitting after all. Heavy Rain in itself isn't really a bad game. It's just a really bad story. And which, considering that's the main driving force, is problematic. Too many elements are brought up only to immediately be dropped, like blackouts and asthma. One of the characters' entire backstory was completely removed, making their inclusion just absolutely unnecessary. Characters make extremely questionable decisions, and large portions of the plot fail to make any sort of sense when you put it into the larger context of the world. I still don't get why Scott and Lauren were attacked for continuing their investigation on Gordy when they didn't. But what's funny? It's not even that bad of a story. It's also not even the worst twist that I've seen. That goes to True Detective. But the writers dropped the ball on a few too many critical points, hastily stitched the pieces together, and hoped that no one would notice or care. But I noticed. And as someone who's been writing for over 20 years, I care. Because bad writing shouldn't be praised. And look, if you made it to this point in the video, then clearly I did something right. 
I managed to hold your attention for almost three hours. So why don't you do me a favor, hit that like button, and maybe consider subscribing down below to see future videos like this. Especially if you want to see videos like my reaction to Beyond Two Souls, or maybe even Detroit Become Human. I also have like an eight hour long video about The Last Jedi, but we'll get to that when we get to that. For now, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.